Good morning. I had said good morning with my mute on. <laughs> hey, good morning. I'm going to go ahead and pass you the ball. Okay. There you go. Thank you. And I'll start the chat. I'm gonna see how I can share and get that going. Now, let me double check that we've got the chat and not the. We haven't got the um, question and answers because I know we don't want that. Okay. Q and A is turned off. Why? Okay. Q and A is turned off and chat's available. Awesome. Okay. And. Nobody else. Okay, good. I'm going to put myself on mute so I don't talk too much. <laughs> All righty. Morning, everyone who's here. Um, we'll get started in a couple minutes, just letting people find the password if they need it and all that good stuff. So we'll get started on 902. Thanks. All right, it's 902 by my watch. So I will go ahead and get us started. Stephanie, do you want to go to the next slide for me? Sure thing. Great. Okay, thanks, everyone. Slow on my end. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. 
Uh, this is me saying welcome to our third workshop. Um, I'm sure that you are used to this drill at this point and know all about the Oregon Department of Energy at this point too. I'm really grateful to um, have the chance to show off our skills as a central repository of energy data information and analysis and as a venue for problem solving Oregon's energy challenges with this study. We can go to the next one. So just the basic usual caveats that we'll be recording the meeting. Um, we encourage the use of chat and we have staff that can answer our questions there, um, encourage participants to answer questions there too. And then in addition, you can also raise your hand. Um, we'll often bring the chats into the conversation. So it's a good place to just like put something if it's on your mind without interrupting the flow and then we'll make sure we get to it. And then we have public space for public comment on the end of the meeting. And right now it says staff will work on determining the next date we need to get that out of here. We already have the, the next date. It's going to be July 28th will be workshop number four. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and at this point, hopefully you're all very familiar with WebEx, but to raise your hand, um, you started, there's like an icon at the bottom um, that for me looks like a little smiley face or a fist raised in the air. This fist raised is actually the hand raised sign. Um, feels a little more political than it than it really is, and then um, and then you'll also you can also kind of click by your own name and raise your hand that way, and then um, we can go to the next slide, and we'll, we can skip this one at this point. I think hopefully everybody is familiar with WebEx, um, and then same sort of drill as in the past with how the meeting will be facilitated. I'll be moderating today. What's different is Stephanie will be our lead staff today, so. Um, she is the economist that was specifically hired to handle some of the issues that are going to come up today for this study. Uh, so we're really excited to have her and you'll get to see a lot of her today. And then, um, like I said, it's time at the end for public comment. And then on the work group agreements, um, these are these are some agreements that we've been using for our meetings this year. We really just want to make sure that we foster an inclusive and respectful meeting today. We know that there's issues um, just it's like last time um, and the time before that um, there are just differing opinions on in this work group. And it's our job as the Department of Energy, not necessarily to find agreement among all of you, but to capture those different opinions on all the different sides. But we also want to make sure that we have room for recommendations. So as you're thinking and talking about things that you wish were different, I hope that you can also think about ways that you could possibly solve those problems that you want to bring up. And just remember, as we go to be respectful of others, even if they disagree with you, of course, we have again, time limitations. Um, we have a bunch of people presenting for 10 to 15 minutes today, but we also want to save space for the, um, the breakout sessions and then the discussion of those, because that's really where we're planning on getting from all of you, your thoughts on the benefits. Um, and the costs uh, issues that we're going to bring up today. So um, that's kind of the, the bread and butter. We want to set up and have you hear from others that aren't aren't necessarily on the work group, although some of our presenters are, but then also have the space to share new ideas, those recommendations that we've talked about that we can make as a group um, in the final report. Uh, so um, with that, if there's technical issues, Linda Ross in the chat is a good person to contact. You can also bug me and I'm happy to see if I can figure something out for you. I'm um, either logistically or or technically. So um, those are 2 options there. Anything you want to add Stephanie? I think that sounds good. Okay, awesome. All right, next slide. And then our agenda today, um, just a, just a heads up um, the agenda we sent out had a list of presenters. We have added um, a presenter to talk about a project uh, for Patu Wind today. And then we also had a request to add uh, Rafaela Sue Flanders from Bonneville Environmental Foundation. And I think if we hadn't heard back from her right by yesterday, mm -hmm. so we'll continue to try to grab Raf and see if she can come and present at that workshop number four on that project. We heard that request loud and clear. If that's not a possibility, we can work on figuring out some other way to make sure we hear about that project. So just want to make sure you know this is your work group. We're listening, and when we get suggestions, we're doing our best to honor those, and we'll continue to do that throughout the process. We'll also make sure we honor breaks. It's a long day, so just know we'll make sure we keep those. Okay. And then you, next slide. And then um, just basically a quick note that our objective is to examine those opportunities to encourage development of small-scale and community-based renewable energy projects that contribute to economic development and local energy resiliency. So that's our mission statement as a staff and hopefully for you all as a group today. And the next slide, and I think 
It's on to you, right, Stephanie? Yes, yes. We're going to keep the introduction um, pretty brief today uh, because we really do want to give as much time to our speakers as possible. Um, so really, we're just going to walk through the questions um, that we have discussed in the past about this area um, so that you can keep them in mind as you're listening to the speakers today. And if any questions form um, along these themes, please do ask the speakers as we go. So to start with the different um, benefits, um, we really want to look at what is differentiating um, small scale renewable projects from the larger scale and utility scale projects. So um, we want to look at the economic benefits that are common between these and unique to small scale projects and how can these benefits be valued. Um, and then we want to look into resilience and um, what are the potential resilience benefits of these projects? Um, how can we differentiate between resilience benefits that accrue to individual customers versus communities versus the grid? Um, and how can they be valued? Uh, then go into the go other, other, other. Oh, a little echo. Oh, yeah. Um, go into other benefits. Is everybody hearing that or is it just me? We're all hearing it. I'm trying to see if somebody's off mute. Okay. All right, I'll move into the next slide. So after other benefits, those can include um, health, climate, et cetera. Um, but we do want to identify those as well. Um, and then getting into rate impacts and costs. Um, so what are the rate impacts of these projects? Um, what are they going to be for the participants and owners of the project? And what are they going to do to overall utility rates um, for non-participants in the project? Um, go into costs. What are the unique costs? We, we've talked in prior uh, meetings about um, you know, the different economies of scale and how we might not be getting those necessarily with small scale. Um, we just want to see how big those are and um, what things can be done to overcome them. Um, if there's any barriers, as we discussed in a prior workshop, that can be um, used to mitigate some of those additional costs. Um, and then just other questions. What gaps in information um, do we have regarding these costs? What data do we need? Um, these are the kind of things that we want to be thinking about as we move into the final report. All right, so have those in mind as we go through our stakeholder um, presentations today. So we have six wonderful speakers lined up for you, um, and we're going to go in this order. It's a little um, changed from what I had originally planned, uh, just due to time restrictions for uh, some of our um, speakers today. So we're going to start with Dave Moldal from Energy Trust. And I will pass it over to Dave. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a quick shout out. Thank you, Odo staff, for the excellent work that you're doing here convening this discussion. It's a big, big mercurial topic. I uh, just wanted to thank you profoundly. Again, my name is Dave Moldall. I'm the senior program manager at Energy Trust of Oregon. I manage the other renewables program, kind of the unfortunately named non-solar side of the renewable sector at Energy Trust, primarily focused on in-conduit hydropower project development and biopower project development. Next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so quick boilerplate and then I'll get into the costs and benefits uh, from a uh, quick summary. So Energy Trust of Oregon is a 501c3 not-for-profit for those of you on the call that may not know it. We're, we operate, in, operate under a grant agreement with the OPUC. We provide comprehensive energy efficiency and renewable energy programs and financial incentives to serve customers of the five investor-owned utilities in Oregon. So our core business is to provide incentives for cost-effective energy efficiency projects and help pay for the above market costs of renewable energy facilities under 20 megawatts in nameplate capacity. Since 2002, we've provided expertise and financial incentives to support installation of over 20,000 now, this slide's a little bit out of date, net metered solar projects, most of those being residential solar, 46 small wind turbines, 14 hydroelectric plants, 12 biogas cogeneration facilities, as well as two biomass and two geothermal facilities. Over the years, we've learned and shared best practices in project development and operation to support small-scale renewable energy developers and operators, the vast majority of whom are using renewable energy offset electricity used in homes and businesses. Next slide, please. 
Again, big topic. I'll start with highlighting just a few of the many benefits that I'm sure we'll discuss this morning, which are maybe self-evident to a lot of people on the call and involved in the industry, but four examples. So net meter rooftop solar installations have enabled many Oregon families and businesses a new way to manage their energy use. The state's community solar program and Portland's clean energy benefit funds certainly offer opportunities to expand solar access to low and moderate income communities that have previously been unable to participate. And House Bill 3141 now requires energy trusts to invest at least 25% of renewable funds for the benefit of low and moderate income customers. In conduit hydropower, made possible through the modernization of irrigation district infrastructure, offers the promise of using re revenue from energy sales to help service debt from piping. Modernization of irrigation infrastructure results in delivery of pressurized water to farms and yields permanent energy efficiency gains from the removal of pumps. These pipe systems also yield significant water savings and water being left in rivers and streams for fish and wildlife while also making agricultural water supplies more reliable during drought, which seems to be perennial, all strengthening our rural economies. Third, biogas cogen projects at municipal water resource recovery facilities, those wastewater plants of the 20th century, have the capacity to transform wastewater treatment and convert commercial and residential organic waste, such as post-commercial food waste, into biomethane that can be combusted to generate electricity and thermal energy. This process keeps these greenhouse gases uh, producing materials out of landfills, minimizing the carbon footprint from their transportation and enabling nutrient recapture, all while generating enough electricity to often meet or exceed on-site energy needs. And last benefit highlight, of course, these distributed renewable energy projects create local jobs, help Green Oregon's electricity supply and produce many other significant energy and non-energy benefits. Importantly, the energy benefits from distributed renewable energy facilities accrue to both the project owner as reduced energy costs utility rate payer, payers as a whole in the form of grid services and may enable the deferral of distribution system upgrades. The quantifiable benefits aside, small scale distributed renewables now certainly face significant costs and challenging pathways to commercial operation. Energy Trust works to support projects through the many issues that arise in the development process, but our efforts and available funding cannot eliminate the barriers beyond our control. Next slide, please. First, a few comments about the solar market specifically. We've seen very optimistically a significant benefit to the solar market resulting in the technology curve over the last couple decades. Over time, manufacturing of panels has greatly improved and a robust network of trade allies have developed here in Oregon, all leading to these systems getting less expensive. Costs are coming down largely, but there is uncertainty in costs in the residential and commercial markets, such as those caused by the Commerce Department investigation permitting costs, variable financing fees, and decline in incentives. The net metered energy benefits solar systems provide customers in Oregon are profound. However, customers nor utilities are not yet capturing all the value streams that these distributed renewable energy systems could provide, which will be brought about through wide adoption of energy storage systems, smart inverters, and pairing solar with hydropower biopower, for example, to support resilient microgrids. Next slide. Now a few comments on distributed renewable development and operation. First, contractual and revenue related barriers. Given the fairly low avoided power prices we have, there, are, there is significant preference for distributed renewables that can net meter, spinning the meter backwards to offset retail power prices over those that would sell electricity to the utility. Small scale qualifying facilities only earn wholesale market based rates for the power they sell to the utilities. These rates based on utility avoided costs do not account for the societal and environmental benefits or ancillary services these projects provide. Presently, current market rates do not provide enough revenue to support unsubsidized investments in distributed renewable energy generation systems, leading to reduced distributed renewable deployment. Second, for qualifying facilities, developers often have difficulty eliminating the amount of, excuse me, estimating the amount of power small scale distributed renewable systems will produce. Yet utility power purchase agreements generally provide little leeway for underproduction. 
Utilities clearly need confidence in generation estimates and actual production in order to manage the grid efficiently. However, if a distributed renewable project fails to meet, meet its production obligations, even for reasons outside of its operator's control, a termination of the power purchase agreement may result. Second, grid-related costs and barriers. The processes for interconnecting to the grid can be confusing and difficult for inexperienced developers to navigate. While utilities have an important function in maintaining grid safety and reliability, late development stage interconnection and upgrade cost information and extended upgrade timelines create financial unpredictability and can be often too much for small projects to absorb. Second, Sub-megawatt projects, those distributed renewables with the nameplate capacities under a megawatt, for example, in particular faced a number of barriers and incur additional costs in development. They generally face the same contractual and interconnection requirements as, say, a 10 megawatt project, which imposes significant costs and obligations on small project developers. Small-scale distributed renewables that sell power to utilities typically must also pay for transmission service and purchase more transmission capacity than the projects can use. Together, these variable costs generally represent a much higher percentage of total project costs for small-scale distributed renewables than they do for larger projects. The combination of high variable costs, uncertain costs, along with diminishing revenue opportunities creates a fragile economic environment for these projects. Third, operational costs and barriers. Certain distributed renewable technologies have the potential to provide significant community benefits, yet also carry inherent risks and uncertainties for developers. Newer advanced distributed renewable technologies often have higher costs than, are more commonly, than the more commonly deployed technologies and have uncertain operating or maintenance expenses. Because premium rates for specific distributed renewable technologies are not available, Developers are often deterred from investing in technologies that can provide valuable, valuable social benefits but carry more economic risk. For example, agricultural or community-based anaerobic digester biopower facilities, such as those at confined animal feeding operations, feedlots, or in urban or suburban locations may struggle to maintain consistent feedstock supplies and feedstock shortages can contribute to underproduction that jeopardize compliance with contractual energy production obligations. All these costs and barriers aside, I wanna con conclude with a few encouraging comments. Oregon has tremendous potential to increase its distributed renewable small-scale deployment across the state and give local communities the opportunity to enjoy the variety of energy and non-energy benefits these technologies can provide. Energy's distributed renewable deployment is currently constrained by a combination of factors, including economic pressure, technical limitations, market forces, et cetera. Concerted efforts to, main, to mitigate these cost constraints and align policy objectives and market price practices could enable significant expansion of distributed renewables. Also, small renewable energy projects can form the backbone of a new resilient energy system that could help Oregon communities weather the variety of challenges they face from public safety power shutoffs to other natural disasters we hope will never strike. When paired with battery storage, perhaps solar and islanding technology, these installations can provide backup power to maintain critical infrastructure and community services, as well as ensure that local businesses remain open even when the broader utility grid is not able to function. These systems, when paired with battery storage technology, can provide additional utility grid services that support higher penetration of renewable energy when the grid is operating normally. Additionally, distributed renewable development directly benefits local communities by creating jobs and generating revenue for local projects. Community-cited distributed renewable systems also give consumers and municipalities some control over where their electricity comes from and allows them to play a direct role in the energy market. In conclusion, Energy Trust remains incredibly optimistic about the benefits of distributed renewables in Oregon communities, especially with the passage of House Bill 3141, House Bill 2021, including now the opportunity for government entities to use the green tariff in partnership with utilities to support community-based renewables. We strongly, strongly believe the many challenges can be addressed in ways that benefit our communities, our utilities that provide this essential service, 
project owners, as well as developers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. Appreciate the presentation. Any questions from our panel? Good morning, panel. We're ready for you. You can raise your hand. You can ask questions in the chat. Oh, rain feast. Perfect. Hey, thank you for the presentation, Dave. Um, not sure if the questions could hear, or maybe if our um, this will be covered later in other presentations, but just kind of curious. If we have a good sense of what the percentage of cost breakdown would be for these projects, whether it's for like the breakdown between like materials, labor, and you mentioned like sort of grid connection and all these other processes. I'm just kind of curious um, what that percentage breakdown uh, is, like a top level. Boy, it's extremely difficult giving the high, the high variability in, in different projects from a 20 kilowatt in conduit hydropower project to a, a multi megawatt scale project. Um, obviously, with inflation right now, we're seeing massive increases in, in contingency fees in the, in the capital stack of a project. Um, unpredictability doesn't lead to attractive projects, certainly from the perspective of the project owner. I wish I could give you specific breakdowns of capex of materials would be this amount, this percentage, and the interconnection will be this percentage, but I can't. It, it's highly variable. That's that's understandable. That I appreciate that response, and I think that's just probably just a general question I'll have. Like I think, as as you noted, like as the cost for materials or technology um, goes downward, you know, just kind of curious what that means for the overall cost of a construction of a of a project. And as as we probably understand, like wages are probably going up due to uh, labor shortages or just needing to attract. Um, uh, workers, I'm just always curious whether, like, is it, you know, 20%, 30%, you know, and I know there's times of scale as these projects get larger, but those are just kind of general questions I will have uh, in the back of my head as as we go through um, the different presentations, but appreciate, appreciate your response. Thanks. Thanks, Ranfi. So you can keep asking. <laughs> You'd like, hopefully our presenters heard and we'll try to weave that stuff into you. Any other questions from anybody? Um, it looks like we have a comment, maybe a question. Um, just a note from Angela that material costs are going up right now, even though the trend was that they were going down for quite some time because of the cost of steel has doubled and supply chain issues are driving driving costs up in general. Yeah. So the, yeah, the we're, trend... we're seeing that in solar, we're seeing that in hydropower, biopower. It's it's across the board right now, uh, fairly unprecedented inflation and and uncertainty. So we're seeing the contingencies from project developers being much broader, 25, 30% contingency, just because the unpredictable nature of, of uh, materials and labor costs. Yeah, something, um, Stephanie, that I'm thinking, and I'm not really sure how to weave it in, because I'm like, have this temptation to ask the group right now, which I know that would be a bad idea, but I think we should probably consider like, um, how much we want to balance writing the report from the perspective of like how the economy was like a couple of months ago versus how it is now, like how we're gonna tell that story because it has changed dramatically very quickly is, is my understanding. I know the costs were going up, but now we have the general economic slowdown that's starting to happen. So um, we'll need to, I mean, luckily we have an economist, but kind of balancing the like overall trends and then kind of the, the sudden change. Um, be something to think about. So as we're going through the day today and asking questions and having conversation, I hope folks will think about maybe how to grapple with that. 100%. Good. All right, Stephanie, you wanna bring up our next? Yes. All right, so next we have Ormond Hildebrand from the Patu Wind Farm. Um, so is he on? Thought I saw. As he's getting on, sorry, one thing really quick, Dave, there's a question in the chat. If you wouldn't mind taking a second to answer it, that'd be awesome. And then we can move on. So just pop I can find the chat here. Christy, <laughs> you'll be controlling the slides. Stephanie will have the slides and then I'll come on after the 10 minute mark to give you like a little like, hey, it's been 10 minutes. Yeah. 
Perfect. Uh, my name is Grant Hart. I am a legal extern for SBUA. Um, we're a small business uh, utility advocate. And I just had a quick question for Dave about um, small commercial or business projects currently that you may or may not know of. Um, has there been much discussion about like, for example, like rooftop solar being put on shopping malls or you know, on uh, downtown businesses, have have you seen very much of that? I might punt that to Angela. Um, I work almost exclusively exclusively with municipalities, irrigation districts, um, local governments. As far as commercial projects on shopping malls, um, I suspect there are some in our portfolio and the commercial side of the solar side of our residential sector. I was wondering if Angela could comment on that, if she knows of any. Yeah, I can jump in. There's definitely commercial projects happening all over the state. I just learned about one today in um, Wood Village area of Portland on a meat processing facility. Um, yeah, lo lots of commercial projects all over. Uh, that's That's great to know. Thank you very much. All right, so now let's hand it over to Ormond. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Can we go to the uh, first slide, please? Sure. My name is uh, Ormond Hildebrand. I'm the um, original founder developer of Pachu Wind Farm um, in North Central Oregon, uh, Sherman County, about three miles outside of the, the town of the uh, megalopolis of Wasco. Um, we're in the Klondike area. Um, next slide, please. I was asked really to give a little bit of overview of Patu and you know some of the community wind renewable energy benefits to the um, to Patu. I want to talk a little bit about when I talk about community. I I really refer to you know the uh, local investor, you know, people who are local in the community who invest and build these types of projects as opposed to, let's say, an absentee landowner or absentee owners of a utility who are, you know, outside shareholders who may be involved in the project. Next slide. Why I feel community renewables are important to Oregon. Um, it's our local resource. You know, we 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 have it. We've lived with it. We know it. We ought to be able to develop it. We can use it to improve our community. Um, I think you know the National Renewable Energy Labs, Oregon State University of Minnesota, have all done studies on community renewable energy as compared to absentee renewable energy projects. And, you know, and they they can show in their studies, their uh, econometric studies, even a 3.5 to a five times more return to local economy as compared to absentee re renewable energy projects. As the University of Minnesota studies simply states, the money stays in the community. And I can attest to the fact, you know, the money that I make stays in the community. I buy local, I buy my vehicles from the local uh, Dodge dealer in the Dalles, you know, we're, we're, we're a local, a local uh, firm. And we can provide long term base employment to 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 technicians and people in the area. Next slide, please. And we're synergistic with the larger scale renewable energy. And let me be right up front here. I could not have built how to win without the massive development of the larger utility scale projects from Ibadrola, Avon Grid, from Portland General Electric, Bigelow Canyon. They provided that massive you know, availability of technicians and trains to the area that allowed me to get the zone. So, you know, I look at, I, I don't look at this as an either or, it's a synergistic. Um, you know, I I think that, you know, we're, we're vital to each, each other. Um, within the community renewable projects, local investors, you know, improve community acceptance when it's a community. When you have local investors involved, local people who have been part of the community for 
not just for years, but for generations, uh, it really helps smooth the acceptance into the community. And I see definite up, upside potentials for these types of local investor community projects. Solar and storage are just becoming into this area. We need to be able to maximize the existing generation assets. Um, yeah, my project, Pachu Wind, is a nine megawatt facility. I have the infrastructure, the low ground uh, distribution facility to transmission to the substation. The substation is built out for 10 megawatts. The long-term transmission with deep with Bonneville power is 10 megawatts. I need to be able to maximize the, the use of this facility. So, you know, I could probably easily expand uh, the generation by at least twice with going to a solar and storage facility uh, down down the road here, and that's some of the plans that I have. Next slide. So Pontu is just one example. Um, here's a picture of the, the site itself. Um, next, next slide, please. You know, a little bit of the background. Um, my family was involved in farming out there since the 1860s. Some of my great grandfather and the original um, tractor out there in the area. We had some of the original wind rights uh, being sold to uh, E. Bedrill and and Avangrid. But in 2005, Avangrid decided not to develop part of the leased area. So I decided, much like an infill project for a housing development in in the Portland area, I decided to take the small amount of land that Avangrid really didn't want to have and decided to take the lease back and develop it myself with wind. At that point in time, solar was really not an option. Um, the solar rates really weren't, hadn't, the solar cost of photovoltaic panels really hadn't come down at that point, so it made more sense to go with wind. Next, next panel, please. You know, I have some definite reasons to move forward in 2005. One, I knew the wind resources. We've been tracking resources for a long time out there. I have some of the very initial existing studies that helped develop um, uh, Iberdrola as development out there in the area. I had, as I mentioned before, I had the large existing developments that were already present with the, you know, the massive cranes and, and manpower. Plus, at that time, too, we had the Oregon Business Energy Tax Credits. Although I look back on this right now, I not too, you know, they were important, but they weren't the defining critical piece of going forward here. Um, the Oregon PUC early on recognized, in, I think it was 2005, 2007, that small QFs and uh, PURPA uh, avoided cost rulings were important to the area. Uh, Sherman County did some of the original work on on, on make, making sure those um, avoided cost tariff rates got, got set. Um, and really when it comes down to it, you know, my cost of generation are really immaterial to the purpose of avoided cost rates. When my, my rates were set, they were based on basically what it would cost an investor-owned utility to go out and buy power on the market from an existing thermal fire gas facility. That's what, what my rates were, you know, in, in, in a very simplistic form, that's what they were set at. So it's up to me to make a profit with those rates. Um, it's not up for the rate payer to, if I can't, if I can't maintain my costs, I don't, I can't go back to the rate payer, rate payers to say, you know, I need more money for my rates or anything else. You know, I am locked into to that. I have to make do with it. Um, another very critical piece or where there's the federal investment tax credits. Um, the PTC for smaller, uh, for these smaller facilities really is difficult to utilize because you can't, it's difficult to aggregate and monetize the uh, production tax credits. With the federal tax credit, especially the, um, you know, what was established in the, uh, in 2009, that was a critical piece. Next slide, please. But with my, you know, six 
turbines, nine megawatts, uh, six GE, one, 1 1.5 units. I generated power for about 3,000 homes in the Portland area. Total investment, about 22 million. And more than 7 million, that was within the, was fit within the region during, during construction. You know, I, I am the fifth largest taxpayer in Sherman County, in the last 10 years, I paid over a million dollars in in taxes. And I can assure you, you know, Sherman County Judge DeBolkus will 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 say that this is this is an important piece to the the county's the county's financing. And I have ad, annual regional payrolls in a na neighborhood of around three hundred thousand thousand dollars a year. Next slide, please. You know when. The, you know, the Oregon PUC recognized um, the importance of small renewable energy projects below 10 megawatts by establishing uh, firm PPAs for a 20 year period. You know, that really allowed me to go to the bank um, and, this, and, and put together a package that could be financed. Without this, without this firm EPA for a 20 year period, you just, I just couldn't have done it. Uh, this was, this was a vital, vital factor. And it's changed since then um, over the years. But, and I, I hope that this group can sort of get this back on track within the, the PUC because it is, it is critical that these firm, that these projects are going to go forward. Uh, next slide, please. In the past, as I mentioned, the small energy loan program, which was critical. Um, Mike McArthur is on the panel right now is a part of that. Um, you know, having the small energy program was critical because I was able to take, you know, after construction financing through CoBank and go into a long-term small energy program uh, loan facility that the state of Oregon had. And as I mentioned before, the investment invest tax credits. Next slide. But now, uh, as we look at this, um, you know, we really need to have this mandate for from the Oregon PUC enforced, where we wanted to have six to eight percent of the, you know, energy generation through the state, renewable energy generation from the state come from the small investor community projects. We've had this, you know, we've tried to get this passed at CREA for a number of years. It's on the books, it's just not being, it's not being enforced. Um, we need to have, you know, a PPA tariff, not just for wind and solar, but we need hybrid tariffs that allow us to go into, you know, dispatchable delivery up to 10 megawatts continuous. You know, we want, you know, that's gonna be critical as we go forward to provide this resiliency to the grid and to our our local area, um, and this all has to be locked into a firm twenty year PPA. Next slide, please. Why should the Oregon Department of Energy be involved? Because it's community re re the community renewable energy is important to our region's future. We got to have a mix. We can't just have all large scale IOUs, all large scale. Um, you know, utilities scale projects, you know, the smaller distributed as Oregon Trust of, has brought up the distributed energy sources, the behind the meter sources, the local facilities like, like mine, we gotta have a, a mix to be resilient here as we move forward. Next slide. There are some other examples that, that, have, that have occurred in the last 10 years now. I want to say up front, this might be a little bit old because I didn't have a chance to update this uh, yesterday. But you know, Lime Wind in, in Baker County was another example. They have a, a three megawatt project, six uh, 500 kilowatt uh, rebuilt units, um, and they sell power to the uh, Idaho Power Company. They are uh, another example of a local project. Next slide. I think really important to to me, and it should be to to the group as a whole. Um, the community action program in Aberdeen, Washington, built uh, coastal wind, which was four GE 1.5 megawatt turbines. It get a chance 
take a look at this, uh, the, the video uh, of the project. It's really impressive. It's right there on the coast. It's done for and you know, an area that was that was that was struggling. Um, I think, and you know, I've talked to Craig DeBlanco, the the manager of the uh, Coastal Community Action Program. Um, many times, you know, they take the money that they receive from this project and plow it right back into the community, into food assistance, into housing assistance. You know, this is this is this has been a critical part of that of that area. I think it's still. Still in existence, still on their, still on the website at least, um, and I encourage the group to get to get to know it better. Next slide. You know, Minnesota I think still leads in community uh, programs. You know, they've had a lot of um, you know community de developments going forward, and here, here just just some of the others um, in the area. Next slide. I think one of the exciting ones too I saw was up in Kodiak, Alaska, where a community project built from three 1.5 uh, GE units was really built to take uh, the diesel power generation out of the um, equation. Um, you know, these may not be a direct payment back to the community, but it was a definite uh, plus win for the community itself. Next slide. And we go up to you know uh, towns in the northeastern part of the U.S. in uh, New York and places. Um, you know they've there have been a wide region of wide areas of successes for these types of projects. Next slide. In South Dakota, we're in one town where 606 residents formed a cooperative and built their own project. So, you know there's there are. Other examples just in just beside the ones that we have. And then the final slide. I think some of the critical success factors really for any of these projects, you gotta have a vision and a plan. You have to have good project leadership in place. You gotta involve the community up front. You have to be able to provide financing and you have to have a strong pricing re regime. And then the deciding permitting and interconnection, all these are critical for going forward. And, whether it's solar, wind, biomass, anything right now. I think that's it, Stephanie. Yeah, just some of the great partners and friends that I have had, Oregon Department of Energy, CoBank, which provided the construction financing, Evadrol, of course, EDF Investus, which provided my maintenance contracts, GE, um, Seattle City Light, which buys the, the Rex, Wasco Electric, and Sure, Sherman County, of course. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Gorman. Uh, any questions from the members of the work group? And anyone's welcome to ask a question in the chat. Grand fees? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, thanks. Thank you for the presentation, Ormond. Uh, you mentioned something uh, earlier about it seems like a synergistic relationship with some of the larger development and and a smaller scale project as it relates to uh, recruiting uh, workforce. Can you say more about about that sort of the the needs of being able to attain a workforce for some of these smaller projects? And in addition to that, just kind of curious. Um, uh also if these are you know local jobs or are these uh, a workforce from all over the state or other parts of, of the region yeah uh that's that's a extremely important question that's one one of the one of the issues that i had a high degree of concern about in the very beginning who was going to maintain these units <laughs> you know I'm, I'm i'm way too old to start climbing these towers uh myself um and, and that was, you know, I and, and we struggled with that. Uh, when we first started to get into the project, we we thought that GE um, GE Wind Energy could supply the service. They unfortunately could not. So I had a, you know, I was I was I was extremely lucky that um, uh, EDF, which had a maintenance contract with uh, leading Juniper in. Arlington, I think Lady Juniper, that's a Pacific Core uh, facility. 
uh, was able, to, I was able to piggyback on any some of their resources that they had already in the in the area to to provide maintenance to my facility. And maintenance is, is not just not just um, you know defining you know to, uh, fixing a fault on the units that's tripped. It's it's doing the periodic maintenance. It's providing basically upgrades to blades and uh, generators as required. And then the other factor, which is absolutely critical too, is the is the 24-hour, seven seven days a week monitoring of the, of the facility. EDF was because they're already in the area, were able to to do that. When EDF left the area, Vestas was able to pick up that contract. Vestas had uh, similar contracts with Montag and Con in uh, Condon in uh, Bigelow Canyon with uh, Portland General Electric. Um, you know, I, I, again, I would not be able to do this without those assets being in in place. Case in point, you know, I lost a um, I lost a 1.5 Hitachi generator um, about a, a month ago. Um, I was able to mobilize cranes out there to pull that generator out of the nacelle uh, within within about a day. I was able to get crews into the area within about a day. Also, these were all local crews, maybe not all living in the the Wasco area because there's a housing shortage there, but living in the in places from Goldendale to Arlington to the Dalles, Condon, Boardman, they're all around the area. This this is this is a resource that um, I had to have. Thank you. That was great. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, I don't see anything. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, this is Grant from SBUA. Um, I just had a couple questions for you, Ordman, about um, kind of like the model that you have. I saw that you said that um, you had about seven million in local investment, and I was wondering uh, where that investment came from. Was that from community members? Was it from local businesses? I was just curious about that. So that's that's basically so. Seven million that we had spent in the local area during the construction side. The local investment was really it's myself and my brother. We had another uh, local investor from the Hood River area, and then we had a minority uh, outside investor. That's that was this. This is basically the the equity structure. Okay, that that's good to know. And would you say that? Um, this is kind of like a model that perhaps um, with better regulation could become easier for businesses to kind of band together to create these projects. Or oh, yes, what? yes. In fact, I, I look at I, I would hope that eventually, you know, structures within Oregon on a cooperative basis could could do this type type of work. Um, I, I think, you know, I know of at least. Probably enough, you know, private individuals uh, who are looking at who have looked or talked to me about developing upwards of 100 megawatts. If you add everything up to together, could be done. If if this type of structure could be could be replicated for the future, uh, it's difficult to do. Uh, it's not going to fit at every site, but it, it can be done. Uh, that that's great. And just one last question. Um, I. Did also recall from your presentation you mentioning that um, sometimes with the intermittent nature um, PPAs can be difficult to navigate uh, for projects like this, especially if you're not um, generating for a utility. So um, have you looked into perhaps uh, battery storage options? Well, I, I I have, and and that's one of the areas that we want to go down. You know, we, as as I mentioned, you know, everything I have is built out for 10 megawatts. But you know, I have a net capacity factor around 36 percent. So that means 65 percent of the time, you know, my my build out, my below ground distribution line, my substation, my transformer, my interconnection with was with Wasco Electric, my BPA transmission is not being utilized to its fullest capacity. Why can't I put in in 10 megawatts of solar with a Storage capacity on a on a battery that gives me maybe two hour of a battery shift. Then all of a sudden my power becomes much more valuable to the grid. But there's no 
there's no PPA in the Oregon PUC right now that I can that I can do do that with. Um, underneath the new FERC rulings with FERC, excuse me, Northwestern versus Broadview, I think out of Canada, you know, it, it gives me some insight in how I could do that if I wanted to do that on a negotiated basis. I really don't have the skill set to do that. I, I really need to work with the PUC, get get a firm PPA with the firm tariffs established with that type of dispatchable capacity. That's what I want to do. Perfect. Thank you so much, Orman. All right. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions from our committee. Oh no, Dave has his hand up now. Great, Dave. Go ahead. Thanks. I'll make it. I'll make it quick, Christy. Dave Molal, Energy Trust. Orman, thanks for the presentation. You had mentioned the success of small or community scale uh, wind energy development in, in Minnesota. Um, now, taking into account, of course, the in some respects different wind regime, different uh, availability of wind resources throughout Minnesota. What what do you see are the main differences? Why the success there, not here? What are the market forces at play? What has happened in Minnesota to drive that industry forward? Well, I think one of the things in the very early on, and I'm sure it has changed the last 10 years, but very early on, Minnesota was one of the original states that initiated what was called the Minnesota flip model, where basically farmers and local landowners could cooperate with the developers where the developers provide the initial financing, you know, maybe finance it for a 10 year period, run it for a 10 year period, and then it would flip to the local landowners after after a set amount amount of time. This is all all within the you know the Minnesota legal system. I'm not that familiar with it um, myself, but uh, it was it was very successful there in the in, in the initial uh, stages. Like I say, I'm sure that's changed, um, and you have to be a nimble on on your feet to keep up with the local all the local uh, tax um, uh, law chain changes. But that's that's sort of what got it going in the very beginning. Thank you. Okay, and then we did have another question from Grant in the chat. I'll just ask it really quickly. He wanted to know, Ormond, how many COVID firm workers, that's Certification Office of Business Inclusion and Diversity. So how many COVID firms worked on the project? Uh, that might not be the answer you know. Not really too. I'm not. I'm not quite tracking on that. On that term it's, itself, maybe you could explain that. Um, yeah, um, Grant. <laughs> I know we're supposed to just be having this conversation with our with our worker members, but Grant, can we get Grant off mute again, and we'll um, we'll have him ask. Hi, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And um, I just wanted to make the panel clear that I'm uh, here on behalf of Diane Hinkles. Uh, she is a work group member. Got um, it. She okay. is she listening on the phone, now. but she's okay. unable to participate right now. Okay. Um, I should have mentioned that earlier. I apologize. Yeah, no um, problem. We'll go ahead and elevate you to a panelist. I, I just want to make a quick comment. Well, you know, the, the project was completely, it was, it was a union built project from the very beginning uh you know 10 years ago 12 12 years ago we really really weren't looking at you know the uh dei um objectives back back in uh, 2010 uh but i but i know as you know seeing the union work workers out there um i think we had a pretty good rep representation but can I say that we met all the current dei goals right now no i can't but we're definitely 100 percent union Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, is that it, Christy? I don't see the chat. Sorry. Yeah, no more questions. Okay, great. So now we are going to move to our next presenter from the California Public Utility Commission, uh, focusing on microgrids. Roseanne, I see you're online. Are you able to unmute? There you are. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Rosanna Kevich, and I am a senior regulatory analyst on the grid resiliency and microgrids team in the energy division at the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, next slide. As part of this team, my one of the main issues that I have been um, charged with working with is uh, determining and discussing and leading discussion groups on the value of resiliency in an attempt to understand how to integrate resiliency issues into our grid planning processes, into our tariffs, um, and how to where those where this topic um, influences some of the other um, proceeding work that we do. So the graph that you're looking at is what I started with in terms of in 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 trying to understand what we're talking about with resiliency. On a official proceeding level, what we are how we approach this is resiliency is a subset of reliability. So if you're looking at this graph, that blue line that comes along is our reliability line. When that drops in response to a disturbance, the magnitude and the speed at which it drops, so the time and the speed represents the magnitude at which that reliability drops to a significant level. At that point, we are in a, a respond and adapt um, phase of, of this resiliency trapezoid. And we are there for as long as it takes before our response or recovery systems start kicking in to bring us back up to the level of reliability that we began with. Our attempt to improve resiliency would be represented by that dotted line where we're trying to raise the floor of our trapezoid. And we might raise that floor by either reducing the magnitude of the disruption in the first place or, ex or reducing the length of time that we're in that response and adapt time or responding to uh, improving our recovery uh, systems so that we can reduce the time before we're back up to speed in terms of reliability. This is this trapezoid was uh, developed by uh, Matthias Pantelli as he studied distribution and transmission line outages um, in response to wind events in the UK. But the system can be understood and looked at from different systems as well. So this might reflect disruption in the energy system, but we can also look at it from the perspective of other interdependent system functions. For instance, our waste and water system potentially going um, being disrupted, um, the gas communications, transportation, all of which you can um, potentially even use the, the disruption that occurred in Texas um, as an example, where energy disruption caused some of these interdependent systems to also be disrupted. We can use this as a, as a representation of our economic system function, um, representing the revenue and productivity in, um, that occurs in response to a power disruption, or our income and perishable losses. In terms of social inequity, we're looking at potentially how many of our vulnerable and disadvantaged populations were affected by this disruption. How many of the critical facilities that serve those populations or out the whole population might have been disrupted. And more recently, we're looking at how much time and money are people using to get their needs met, their basic needs met during the time of disruption. And similarly, what kind of impact are, is this disruption occurring, um, having on our environmental system when we look at what kind of emissions um, and GHGs are, um, are emitted as a result of our potentially as a, our, our response, to, uh, our response and adaptation. These systems can be overlaid. So if the energy system goes out, it might have reverberating impact on some of these interdependent and related systems that might have a much longer response and adapt time than the energy system itself. 
and I have additional slides to show um, if we want to go in this at all, but just uh, understand that um, that Texas example was a good one. Energy came back, but other systems were out for quite a long time in response to that initial disruption. Next slide, please. So how do we take this and and bring this into um, an approach to understand uh, reliability, resilience, and how we bring um, regulation into uh, our planning processes? We started looking at this from a four pillar approach in terms of understanding how to measure resiliency. We wanted to start with a uh, we wanted to to build a replicable, scalable um, methodology by which we could work through um, how wh whether we're hitting all the parts of resiliency because it's quite a complex topic. So in our baseline assessment, we're looking at in in at, at base, we're looking at what do we want to protect, where is it, and who is it, what threatens them, and how well are we doing currently to protect them. Then we take a look at our mitigation measure assessments. What protection options do we have to potentially improve any one of those pieces to raise that trapezoid floor? Which job, which mitigation measure does the best job at protecting the most in an all hazard scenario, potentially with compounded hazards? And what does it cost? For instance, you might choose you might have a series of options, something like undergrounding or microgrids or um, or having a number of people with uh, gas diesel generators. Which one of those might attend to disruption that is caused by several different hazards such that if you spend the money to put that mitigation measure into place, you aren't you are spending that money to attend to many hazards, many possibilities of disruption, because that might end up being the most efficient use of our investment dollars. But we have to figure out a way to, to make that comparison. And then our third pillar is looking at the resiliency scorecard. What are those resiliency configuration characteristics that um, include in California, we're looking to include um, the support of our state policy goals, like reducing our GHG, increasing our renewables, um, and making sure that people can afford the results. And in our resiliency response assessment pillar, how well did these investments do in reaching their resiliency targets? Did the investments reduce the impact on the community? Next slide, please. It's, it, it's important to note that that pillar one baseline assessment and mitigation measure assessment, these should be conducted with heavy collaboration with the local communities to determine the accuracy and the ground truthing of what otherwise might be publicly available or utility provided data. So the utilities might decide what is their priority in terms of de-energization or energization or keeping energized. But it should be ground truth with local communities to make sure that areas that those the emergency, local emergency planners, the cities and the municipalities have identified as priorities for those areas as well. So this is a breakdown of what the, the first slide I showed is sort of a. Uh, uh, bit more of a generalism of what we're looking at. But here what we're doing is um, breaking down the what what does defining who we want to protect and where it is look like. What that means is we're, we're going to be understanding what is the defined geographical area that we're we're looking at. And because this methodology is scalable, it could be a it could be applied to a small scale application like a single customer solution, a multi property solution, or as large as a utility territories regional assessment of mitigation strategies. So, it's agnostic in its application of size, and it's agnostic in its application of what what kinds of mitigation measures we're looking at. In our um, proceeding, 
although microgrids is built into the title of our team, microgrids in this methodology are considered as one of many potential mitigation strategies and also looked at as generally distributed energy resources that have a superpower. That have, their superpower is that they can detach from the grid and continue to operate at some level for some time period uh, when, dis when, um, when uh, disconnected from the grid. So as we look at this, what do we want to protect and where is it is covered by defining our area of study, understanding what are the load tiers or priority categories, consequence categories, and what are our resiliency targets within those load tiers? Do we want to identify 100? Do we want to make sure that at minimum, our, our target, our resilience target is 100% of all critical identified loads? And then maybe potentially another 50% of identified priority loads? And then whatever other discretionary we can potentially fill in. Those consequence categories and those prioritizations should be um, determined in a multi, in a bi-directional communication channel between local communities and utilities, ideally. What threatens these uh, the, our current system is identified by defining the hazards to consider through an all-hazard assessment and conducting assessments of our current resiliency when they're disrupted from these different hazards and potentially um, looking at compounded or cascading events. In mitigation measure assessment, we're looking at when we when we're talking about what protection options do we currently have, we're looking at what are the mitigation measures that attend to that particular geographical area. And what is it, what does the best job of answering it? Um, we're looking at which each one of these hazards at, so that we can identify which mitigation measure has the most capacity to address more than one. For instance, currently right now um, in, in uh, a different proceeding, real for in our Rule 20 um, proceeding, uh, we're looking at undergrounding. And it has been argued that the amount of money spent to underground would also, though, mitigate costs spent on vegetation management or hardening overhead distribution and transmission lines, depending upon where the undergrounding occurs. So that there is a there would be a balance in terms of what kinds of other mitigations that we are avoiding spending money on by doing this one mitigation. And we're talking about the fact that underground it could potentially address flooding as well as high winds, as well as wildfire issues. So that's the kind of comparison that we're looking at doing between mitigations. Next slide, please. The resiliency scorecard provides a mechanism to compare and score mitigation measure characteristics that meet state policy goals, such as decarbonization through GHG emissions. Are we, we have, in California, we have a renewable portfolio standard where we're trying to increase the number of renewables um, as we try to meet our 100% goals, our resource adequacy goals, and meet resiliency goals, which might include identifying what kind of duration are we looking for? When we say resiliency, are we talking about a four hour backup plan or are we talking about a 72 hour backup plan or a 96 hour backup plan or longer? And we're looking at, we're also talking about fuel supply or duration uh, and that, that duration of power in relationship to that fuel supply. Do we need to take into consideration if we're trying to get hydrogen or we're trying to get natural gas, any disruption that might end up happening to either that transportation um, channel in terms of roads or disruption of those pipelines. In terms of, res of our resiliency response assessment, this is where we provide ongoing post-disruptive resiliency assessment utilities apply Roseanne? for yes Roseanne 
Okay, I don't think you're realizing that we're losing you here and there. It's the second time it's happened. So I think maybe even though I love seeing you, it might help to turn your camera off. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. And uh, is there anything that I need to go back over? You were probably quiet for like 20 seconds. It might have been less than that. It just felt a little for just, me, maybe 10, okay. 10 to 20 seconds. And just recently? Uh, yes, just recently. The last time it was shorter. Okay, great. Um, so, in terms of our uh, resiliency response assessment, we'd be looking at in pillar four what we do is we look at we basically go over this cycle one more time but from the perspective of a post disruptive or cyclical resilience assessment for instance in our general rate case we might put into into the general rate case planning uh, 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 process how we're going to address um, how well did our resilience uh, investment um, attempts work when we look at historical disruption events that might have happened within that GRC cycle. So we're, we this we posted this resilience assessment begins at the next iteration of that investment and assessment process. And honestly, this is really where the valuation of resiliency comes to light. This is where when we, we compare and contrast no action versus the dip, different options that we might have taken or that we did take. And we look at what has occurred and how well things have worked. Next slide, please. So this topic has been um, slated for exploration in track five of the microgrids proceeding. The microgrids proceeding was begun in response to SB 1339 legislation that occurred in to, uh, that was passed in September of 2018 in California that directed this PUC in cooperation with a couple of other state agencies to facilitate the commercialization of microgrids, identify barriers, and reduce those barriers as much as possible in order to increase our state's ability to respond and increase our resilience. In track five, what we're attempting to do is follow these key issues that we are that what we we began with a working group um, in track one. We started a resiliency and microgrids working group where we discussed various different issues that have come up in the proceeding, of which we had we held eight workshops on this topic of value resiliency. And each one of in that in the that working group. We discussed the four pillar approach, and then we went into each 1 of those pillars and had discussions. Um, so, each 1 of those pillars represents a whole workshop that we discussed and talked about. Um, the recordings of which are available on our website. We also had some uh, speakers that talked about potential metrics that we could use to assess. How, where we are, uh, how we're doing in terms of that resiliency trapezoid. Should the, so some of the key issues that were identified as a, as key to be considered as part of this discussion of the value of resiliency is should we develop an analytical process to understand direct and indirect economic and equity impacts of power outages to reflect community and utility resilience as we strive to balance reliability with resiliency while continuing to make progress towards our state policy goals, should we adopt a standardized definition of resiliency to provide consistency across proceedings? Understanding indirect power impacts of power outages on communities will require the development or adoption of new metrics, such as the social burden index used by um, the resiliency node cluster analysis tool developed by uh, Sandia National Labs, or the power outage economic tool developed by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, or the interruption cost estimate tool to reflect economic impacts of short and long duration power outages. These tools provide potential metrics that combined with other existing metrics and decision-making tools could help us evaluate resilience mitigation measures when considering projects at the local and the grid level of investment. 
Should there be resili a separate resilience process that works methodically through considerations that are specifically resilience focused that are then integrated into the risk frameworks and the GRC process? And in our grid planning processes, should this, the CPUC establish a more robust bi-directional communication portal between local communities, tribes, and utilities in order to maximize efficiencies, resources, and meet the priorities at the multi-jurisdictional level? And should IOU risk framework I know we've, we've lost Rosanna, just kind of waiting for her to get back. I'll give her another little chunk of time and then we'll see what happens. I think she might have gotten kicked off. She's she's logging back on. So sorry folks. <laughs> And I see a question in the chat already. I'll ask it when she's done. All right, well, we now have two Roseannes on the call and none of them seem to be coming through. Um, Stephanie, how many more slides did she have? I'll just try to hash out. It's her final slide. Okay, maybe what we can do is um, give her a chance to get back on. Here, I have an idea. What if we just took like a little break for like a few minutes? Give her a chance to come back. Give everybody a chance to stretch their legs. Yeah, grab a second. Legs, grab now she's back. Now she's back. Um, hang on, we're gonna. I, yeah. Um, let's do a let's do a three minute stretch bio break. We'll come back in three minutes, and hopefully by then we'll have Roseanne back. Um, so just three minutes. Be back around ten twenty three, and then we'll go back to it. Roseanne, have we got you back? I tried. I tried. I tried. Yeah, I've got a bad echo coming from you. Let me try to mute. Let me try to. I'm gonna mute myself and see if you can talk. Hello. Yeah, I think as long Hi. as I'm muted, your feedback is better. I think we have two of you on. Okay. Okay, Roseanne, I'm gonna, are you on your phone or are you on your, let me get rid of one of you. This is Linda. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, the, the one that looks like a phone icon instead of a headset icon, I think is the duplicate. And then Roseanne, we just had everybody take a couple minutes to like go get a second cup of coffee or go to the bathroom or whatever while we could like get our grounding back. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I've got you on mute, so on both of them on mute. So let me take off the, this is the computer. Can you talk on this one? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, are yeah. you? Okay, you're on the phone, it, right? Yeah, if this works, um, then it just keep me on um, the computer so that I can continue to see the okay. slides and right. the chats. Great. Um, but I'll just talk through my phone and I should have thought of that and called in originally. Um, so, so I we, apologize for that. Yeah, I'm not sure where you left off. Um, we lost you for quite a while. Um, so 
Um, but I know you're how getting ready to wrap this, up. How much of this? How much of this slide did you hear? Um, does, did anybody else track perfectly where she was? I'm not taking notes or anything, and I know other people might be. You were on your last bullet point. You were talking about where the commission is currently. Perfect. Thanks, Stephanie. And then as soon as we get back in a minute, we'll have you do that last bullet point. And then um, we have a question in the chat. We'll see if anybody else has questions for you. So, okay, that sounds just great. give it a minute because I like told people we'd go back on at 1023 after they like grab coffee and went to the bathroom. No I'm sure everybody's just sitting here listening to us like regroup, but that's fine. Okay. <laughs> All right, in like 20 seconds or so, go ahead whenever you're ready, Roseanne. I think I answered Angela Crowley Koch's uh, question. This was mandated. I'm okay. just looking at the questions. Oh, perfect. Great. Okay. All right, we can go ahead and just have you get started and hopefully people are back because I just said to take a couple minutes. Okay. Thanks, Roseanne. No problem. So I apologize, um, I have some intermittent connection here, um, but I'll just um, summarize uh, the last couple of bullets because I'm not quite sure where I left off um, or where you lost me. But um, one of the questions that uh, these are, this is this slide basically identifies the um, the items and issues that we have identified in the scoping ruling that was issued in December of 2021 um, to that we are now going to be considering in our proceeding. And um, to that end, basically the, the basic issues are will, how will we address equity, um, economic and equity impacts? What kind of resiliency standards do we need to set into place? What kind of metrics do we need to adopt? Um, there is, we're looking at specific tools that, such as the social burden index, that can be um, identified through the resilience node cluster analysis tool, which is developed by one of the national labs called Sandia, or the power outage economic tool, also developed by another national lab called Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, who um, is more well known by. Uh, uh, in, in their development of the interruption cost estimate calculator, um, the ICE calculator, that and both of those reflect economic impacts. One, uh, the ICE calculator uh, reflects short duration power outage economic impacts, and the POET, which is currently being piloted and further developed, reflects economic impact of long duration power outages and potentially also regional impact um, as power outages we know can, especially long duration outages, can disrupt uh, supply chain upstream and downstream and also have uh, regional ripple effects. So these tools provide the metrics that combined with other existing metrics, for instance, in California, we have affordability metrics um, and decision making tools can help us start to evaluate resilience mitigation measures when we're considering projects. And ideally, we're trying to identify, we're, we're looking at whether we should adopt some of these metrics so that they can be adopted either in, through our grid planning processes on a project by project basis or on regional initiatives. And that goes back to the, that um, this application of this four pillar uh, process. Um, being scalable. Should there also be a resiliency, a separate resilience process that we work through methodically as part of our grid planning process um, that we build into our risk framework analysis and ultimately our general rate case process? And in our grid planning processes, should the, the CPUC establish a more robust bi-directional communication portal between local communities and tribes and utilities in order to maximize efficiencies resources, reduce redundancies, meet priorities at the, and, and meet priorities at the multi-jurisdictional level. So all of this is um, in an effort to also reduce our risk. For, um, should, we, should we have the IOUs incorporate equity and resiliency considerations into the IOU risk frameworks and to what extent? 
so that we can potentially support not only our resiliency goals as well as our uh, re our renewable goals and our um, reliability goals, but also our environmental and social justice goals. So this is where we are at. We have begun workshops to, to discuss the kinds of metrics and definitions that we might want to incorporate. We have uh, had one workshop on the interruption cost estimate tool. We are having another workshop on the resilience node cluster analysis tool that identifies the social burden index. The social burden index is a, an index that potentially, well, that does provide insight as to who is working hardest to get their needs met based on the time and money that they're spending in disruption. And it's, uh, the tool has the capacity to, in this way, reflect historical inequities that have been institutionalized um, and thus shine light on that so that we can potentially provide mitigation measures to build the rectification of that into our grid planning processes. We'll be continuing with these workshops through the end of this year and a staff proposal will be submitted in Q1, quarter one of 2023. That's all and I'm open to questions. Great, thank you so, so much, Roseanne. This is all very interesting to us, I'm sure. Um, you said you already mentioned an answer to Angela's question that indeed this was legislatively mandated. Um, do we have any other questions? And just so folks know, we have about 45 minutes left and three presentations left. So, so I'm going to answer the Daryanani's question um, oh, about the. Question. Uh, Thank you. Oops, I didn't. What was the name of the portal? Yeah, I guess there's a few questions um, in here. Okay. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, go ahead. So in track. One um, and two of our proceeding, we um, had the IOUs develop a local government portal whereby it's a um, restricted to local governments and tribes to access this information, but basically the portal provides information from the utilities on um, capacity of the grid, where projects have been um, it started to increase capacity or it address issues. It also um, shows areas where um, public safety power shutoffs, which is uh, the planned outages in response to hazard events that might be occurring in California, um, might occur and what areas were impacted. So it has information that local governments can access and use information, use that information to inform projects that they might want to take on in order to increase their own local resiliency. What we are looking to do is um, we are in currently engaged in a, a project where we're trying to identify how helpful would it be to local governments to be able to communicate to the utilities what their priorities are and where those priorities are in their local geographical areas so that utilities can take this into consideration when they're determining their decision making protocols or the, um, on either their uh, de-energization plans or uh, alternatively in their investment planning. And, co and coincidentally, at the same time, that bi-directional communication piece would also help local governments understand what the utilities are doing and what they aren't so local governments can potentially um, leverage resources to provide that, that resilience. Thanks, Roseanne. I'm going to ask a couple, I'm going to ask one more question that's a quick one. And then we have two more, um, if it's at all possible for um, us to be really mindful of, of being concise, that would be awesome. Um, just given the time. Um, so, uh, Angela wanted to know what the name of the power outage tool is. The power there's 1 is called a power outage economic tool poet. 
and that is being developed by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And the other one is the Interruption Cost Estimate Tool um, Calculator, ICE Calculator. And um, information on that can be found just by Googling those. Okay, great. Cool. And then um, we also have two questions from Grant. So for undergrounding, are you looking at that mainly for fire prone areas or more broadly? Currently, because wildfire is the largest and most broad hazard in California, the uh, undergrounding is, there's a very large undergrounding project being proposed by PG&E. And um, although the protocol, their decision-making protocol for where those investments are currently going, that where they're thinking of is not, ha has not yet been determined, um, the, uh, general consensus is that it should be directed towards areas where it would reduce the potential for starting fires or allow for other areas to stay energized because there are some times when transmission lines or uh, sub-transmission lines have been had to be de-energized in order to reduce fire um, uh, in the, the possibility of starting fires um, and areas that have been safe to energize have indirectly had to be de-energized. So undergrounding would potentially help in those areas. Okay, great. And then this last one, and again, um, just um, if there's other resources that you can point us to, that'd be helpful too. This has been like so helpful to think about potential think options for Oregon. When looking at microgrids, have there been conversations on community ownership and operation, or will this be incorporated into utilities as a way to improve resiliency and reliability? And then that'll be our last question. Both. Um, the answer to that is both. Um, and that uh, the consideration of what, what we're talking about community, when we talk about community ownership or community microgrids, we're talking about in front of the meter um, microgrids that are in front of the point of common coupling and would involve more than one customer. Um, and currently there is uh, one project called the Redwood Coast um, Airport Microgrid that is a in front of the meter microgrid was just commissioned last week that provides power um, in times of disruption to more than one customer using both utility distribution um, infrastructure as well as private ownership. These, this topic and is more, quite complex and is uh, part of the track four conversations on multi-property tariffs and also the microgrid incentive program. And you can get more information on that on our website if you look at our micro, Resiliency and Microgrids webpage and the track four issues. Well, thank you so much for making the time, Roseanne. We really appreciate having you. And if you wanna hang out You're for welcome. a little while and see thank if there's much. any other questions that pop into the chat, feel free, but thanks for being here. And then we'll go You're ahead welcome. to the next presenter and just a heads up that we've got like 40 minutes now for the last three presentations. So I'll probably, when you see my face come up, it's me being like, hey, it's been 10 minutes. How are you doing? Do you wanna pause for questions? Go for the whole 15 talking in your choice. All right, and it's a great segue um, bringing up the Redwoods that will be discussed a little bit in not the next presentation, but the following one. Um, but for now we have another exciting microgrid to discuss. Um, Kevin is going to talk to us about the Beaverton project. So I'll give it over to you. Yes, good morning, everyone. Kevin Whitener with PGE and uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm with in PGE, a group we call our uh, Grid Edge Solutions team, which is finding ways to integrate renewable energy and um, integrate in with that energy storage and resiliency opportunities. And so a lot of our projects are sort of, um, uh, you might think of them as more pilot kind of projects, um, trying to get these up and running so that we can get some learnings under our belt um, and be ready to employ all of the, the nice analysis that folks like Roseanne is doing, um, you know, to justify and, and understand the economics behind these. Um, if you would, the next slide, please. So just a quick history here, and I think uh, kind of an interesting history is PGE embarked 
on this technology. About 11 years ago, we built an R&D facility we called the Salem Smart Power Center. Um, it was a five megawatt battery with one and a quarter megawatt hours of storage. So in terms of real usefulness, um, you know, on the grid, it was pretty limited because it had such a small energy capacity. But starting 10 or 11 years ago, PGE started doing uh, some technical testing of this system on our distribution grid. Uh, we did some islanding, we did some grid forming, uh, we tried, uh, you know, some experiments picking up the load on the feeder. Um, uh, so it was a front of the meter kind of microgrid attached at the distribution level. Um, and we just gained a tremendous amount of understanding about these systems. Um, and I think it was fortuitous that we did that. In addition to that, PGE, you may be familiar with PGE's dispatchable standby generation system, which is where PGE utilizes our customers' um, standby generators um, for grid services. When they're not being used in the event of an outage, they're being used for grid services, and PGE has had that program for about 15 years now. And it's really been a, a stepping stone to understanding these more complex microgrids that PGE is launching into now. Um, if you would, change the slide again. So this is one of our more recent microgrid projects that we launched into. It's um, referred to as the Beaverton Public Safety Center. Um, it's actually it's a police station in the city of Beaverton, and we worked closely with this customer um, to integrate with their. Uh, they have about 250 kilowatts of solar. They have a diesel standby generator, and PGE came along with a one megawatt battery and added that to the microgrid. So clearly, a behind the meter microgrid. <clears throat> it's structured a little uniquely in that PGE owns the battery. Um, and of course, the, the city of Beaverton owns the solar and, and the diesel generator. But PGE did the work in terms of integrating those systems together and making a, a, a microgrid out of it. Uh, next slide, please. So you were looking at an artist concept there. Here is an actual um, drone photo that kind of shows the layout. Um, and you can see they have lots of great solar up on their roof. Um, if you look at the lower uh, part of the photo there, you'll see the, the diesel generator and the battery, and you can go to the next slide. Okay, so people always want to know, what do these look like? Um, <clears throat> this was a lot of, um, one fun aspect of this is that what looks like a truck container in front of you is actually the one megawatt, four hour battery provided by a company called Powin in Tualatin, Oregon. So we're really excited to be able to do this work and PGE is, is uh, learning and investing. And we're doing that in partnership with a local manufacturer of uh, energy storage products. So um, we're really fortunate in our area. We have um, not just Powin, but we have another uh, battery storage manufacturer right in our backyard in Wilsonville. Um, so there's a lot of development um, and manufacturing expertise that's that's coming to Oregon and that's pretty exciting. So if you would the next slide we were we were in the infancy of doing this when uh, I just really appreciated Roseanne's presentation because they've done such great work into getting in the details of of planning these resources and understanding the economics behind them and PGE was doing this um, without maybe the benefit of, of that great analysis but we did work hard to involve the community um, in this resiliency planning and I wanted to talk about that a little bit so if you could switch to the next slide please so it's clear, you know, the old utility model is um, we're delivering energy to our customers and we know how to do that and we know what's best and, uh, you know, and, and we'll take care of this. And I think that probably was um, fine 40 years ago, but as we all know, the landscape is changing so much with public uh, safety power shutoffs, um, resiliency requirements, climate change, you know, there's a, there's a whole list of reasons 
why we need to change that utility model. Um, and this project that we did in Beaverton, I think was uh, a great demonstration of that. If you would, the next slide, please. So this speaks to, uh, you know, the resiliency part of it a little bit. I'm gonna talk about um, two things. We're gonna look at the resiliency, reliability, and then we're also gonna look at the grid services because I'm an advocate that says those things need to be um, looked at together. Um, you would have a very difficult time, um, excuse me, I lost my train of thought for a moment. You'd have a very difficult time justifying these projects solely on the basis of resiliency and reliability. And, you know, um, Roseanne used the term superpowers. I love that um, because these systems do have the ability to to provide value, not just when there is an outage, but, um, you know, when, when we're grid connected as well. OK, if you go to the next slide, please. We did a fair amount of work um, internally with community uh, stakeholders, also with the Oregon Public Utilities Commission um, in determining where would this, this was our first behind the meter microgrid, where would this be located? Um, we had at least a half a dozen options and we had some people very enthusiastic about uh, you know saying, hey, put it in our backyard. Um, and we needed to be very thoughtful and careful about how we did that. Um, if you would, the next slide. So with those stakeholders internally in PGE, also with our stakeholders and with the um, Public Utility Commission, we created a fairly complex um, matrix uh, and, and uh, a scoring sheet for how we would analyze where does a microgrid go? And I just want to kind of hit some of the, the high points here. The criteria on the left-hand side, locating it near a critical facility, obviously, um, hospitals, law enforcement, fire stations, water treatment, et cetera, um, you know, as opposed to a, a privately owned manufacturing operation. Um, you, so in our rubric, you were obviously scored higher um, if you were, if you fell into one of these categories. Um, one thing from a technical standpoint, so the next criteria, location near a distributed energy resource, having a battery as a, a, a resiliency resource is a wonderful uh, asset, right? Um, however, um, they work better when they're coupled with something else. And that something else could be solar, that something else could be a rotating machine, um, but just a standalone battery, as we could all understand, has limited value because that battery is going to run out, right? Um, so locating it with additional um, distributed energy resources is a value and, and scored higher in our scoring. Um, here was the third one seems really um, obvious, but it takes some work to figure this out, especially in um, Western Oregon is not having that in a flood zone or a landslide area um, or someplace where the Cascadia subduction zone, you know, will liquefy the uh, the soils and and you know, basically destroy your installation. So we looked at um, <clears throat> a facility that's has other distributed energy resources, not in a flood zone, not likely to be wiped out by a landslide, um, and then some uh, you know more um, socioeconomic impacts. Is it in a highly populated area? Um, you got scored higher for that and then located in an underserved community. Um, and I won't go into all the de details. This was a fairly complex analysis that we did. Um, I did want to point out, if you go to the next slide, that in addition to our um, data that we have internally at PGE, um, there is also a wealth of public information out there. It takes some hunting to find it but there are overlays that you can retrieve um, that'll work with Google Maps and what a wonderful technology that is. Then if you'd switch to the next slide, just wanted to quickly show, um, I mentioned our dispatchable standby generation program, DSG program. What's interesting about these sites, so all these little pins on this map in our service territory, these are sites that 
have an interconnection to our grid. They have a full communication system, normally with fiber optic. Um, they are very tightly and directly integrated into our system. These make wonderful locations for um, battery energy storage um, and, and microgrid development. Not that, that we're limited exclusively to these locations. It's just that they kind of tend to score a little higher uh, in the matrix. And Beaverton Public Safety Center, by the way, was one of those. Um, it was a DSG site um, and does have that tight integration that really helps, um, you know, from a technical and cost standpoint of getting this done. If you would switch to the next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits. Um, and I do want to. Can I just yeah. wait? You're, um, you're at about the 13 minute mark, and we've got a bunch of questions in the chat for you. Oh, okay. So I don't know how you're feeling, but if 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 you could, I if can get through what you have planned real quick. Then we'll have time for the questions, maybe. I can do it. I can go through this very quickly. Um, I wanted to talk about the there's a value for the customer for this resiliency and Roseanne went over that beautifully so let's go on to the next slide the next slide and and I want to stress on this slide the I wanted to put some actual numbers on there whoops sorry back up one wanted to put some actual numbers on there um, I want to stress that these are specific to PGE system okay um, that's really important, but we have requirements for frequency response, contingency reserve, um, and we're getting pretty good at quantifying the benefits of these energy storage systems while we're grid connected for our grid support. Okay, now if you'd move to the next slide, there's a quick rundown of upcoming projects. Some of these are actually in construction and underway. Some of them are uh, awaiting uh, internal uh, approval for capital, um, but we're actively going after these projects. Next slide, please. This is one of my a project I get very excited about. This is a front of the meter microgrid, a community microgrid um, serving the city of Portland's public works building. And this project is um, just getting underway now. We've got some initial capital funding, um, but this will be a microgrid on a section of our feeder and that actually passes through an underserved low-income community and then ends up at the public public works campus up there okay and let's go skate through these next one please and i always like to end with a bang so if you'll put up my last slide we'll go to questions thank you perfect okay perfect. let's do questions all right first up this is a an easy one uh either or um, who's or maybe both? Who's responsible for the maintenance on the project in Beaverton, PGE, or City of Beaverton? Yeah, great question. The quick answer is um, PGE is. We contract a fair bit of that out. So there's a contract for the diesel generator. There's a contract for the battery. Um, oh, the city has to do their own maintenance on their solar, but that's part of our contract when we sign these folks up that we do the maintenance. Okay, great. Thank you. And then a question from Oriana: How did PGE land on the Public Safety Center? Um, wondering if you considered the relationship some communities have with policing, particularly the Black community, and did you look at alternatives? Oh, we certainly did look at alternatives. Um, I have to confess, I I can't speak to this issue of policing uh, and and the Black community. I, I'm trying to think time-wise where that fit in, um, but I can answer uh, very affirmatively, yeah, we, we looked at, it was six or eight different similar kinds of locations. And then um, sort of a, a related question, I'm not meaning to skip around too much, but just because this relates so closely, um, was PGE approached by the city of Beaverton to do a project in Beaverton or the other way around? No, it was the other way around. So we. They got on our radar screen because they were getting into our DSG program and we looked at their site and said, hey, this might be a good fit. So we included them in the, the list um, to be analyzed and they did turn out to be the favorable choice. 
Okay. And then related again, um, so why was Beaverton prioritized over other communities? Um, the, the question here is that there seems like there are higher risk and higher need areas. Yeah. Is there oh, a reason sorry. Hmm? I'm sorry, I, I was looking at the question. So why were they oh, no, prioritized for a microgrid? Seems like there are higher risk and higher need areas. Hmm. Um, I guess I, I have to go back to the 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 matrix that we did, and it, and you can see it's not just risk; it's not higher need. Um, it it has to check all the boxes in that matrix. So you might have a higher risk area that doesn't have that solar resource. And as I pointed out, um, they might be a great candidate for a microgrid. But if all we're going to do is set a battery there, it's not going to make a very functional microgrid. And it's just not going to be, you know, the value is not going to be there. Um, so I, I guess I don't, it, it, it's not as simple as one or two criteria. There are many criteria that get matrixed in. Great. And then um, last question in the chat, and I'll see if we have any hands up. Um, how is the resilient system scaled? Did PGE assess how long the public safety center could reduce load during a grid outage, thereby reducing scale of battery battery in? I'm guessing that's just the ancillary equipment. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I actually like that question very much. So there's sort of two aspects to this. Aspect one is um, I think what the, uh, what Dave is getting at here is there's a very elegant way of, of doing this. And um, yes, Dave, the microgrid control system, um, it, it's a fairly intelligent system. It looks at what is your solar um, resource performance right now? What time of day is it? What day of the year is it? What's the weather doing? Um, how much solar are you likely to have? Um, of course, you always have this diesel generator sitting there and the microgrid controller works really hard not to start that diesel generator. That's one of the goals is do not start the diesel generator unless it's absolutely, um, you know, your last resource. But the microgrid controller does tie in to the city's building management system. So it is essentially telling the building management system, hey, the state of charge is getting kind of low and it's seven o'clock at night and the sun's going to go down um, and it sends a signal to the building management system that require or requests rather um, because the city can override the request but it requests um, uh, changing settings on the water chillers uh, um, and, and other large loads to try to maintain that state of charge for a longer period of time. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, just a note that Roseanne dropped her contact info to the chat. If you want to write her, I'm sorry that I've got an echo. I'll just talk quick. Stephanie, do you want to go ahead and introduce our second to last speaker? Sorry, I couldn't get to mute and control the PowerPoint quick enough. Um, so next we have um, Eric Anderson uh, talking about some of the small scale projects that Pacificor has been working on. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so my, my information will be a little bit more, more practical based on some of what we have learned um, trying to work with customers on developing uh, behind the meter um, resiliency sites. Um, and so we've done some, well, let's let's advance to the next slide. So first we're gonna talk about what we've learned from some programs that we've had at BGE related to sort of single meter, single facility uh, microgrid opportunities. Um, then I am gonna touch a little bit, I, that's too bad Roseanne dropped off, but touch just a little bit on the um, Redwood airport project. I was lucky enough to be on their technical advisory committee, but um, so I'll give a little bit of the public information on that, mostly for just grounding pricing so people can understand what these types of projects cost. 
Um, and then I was going to go into a little bit on uh, how we are changing changing some of our um, planning to understand the pricing of small scale assets um, for utility planning. Um, and I thought I would have some more information from the 2023 IRP, but it's not done. So I've got some more generic information. So we'll just go really quick through some of those things um, and, uh, and just get some more practical sort of and ground us more on what the pricing and costs of these systems really is. So next slide, please. Um, just super high level, we've had uh, the, what we call community resiliency programs in both Oregon and California for the last couple of years. They're back. They're basically two prong programs. One is to uh, provide a consultant to do a high level scoping review of the site to determine what options there might be for um, uh, for leveraging solar or some other generating technology and storage to increase the facility's resiliency and decrease their reliance on sort of fossil fuel backup. Um, we then in each state have had some funding to try and get projects um, actually constructed. Um, in fact, in Oregon, we do have a grant window with some money available um, at the end of the summer trying to get a few projects actually built. Uh, it's a little different than PGE's program where it's PGE owned uh, projects. Uh, it's more of a rebate or a, some incentive funds to pay for uh, the project, but they would be customer owned. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we do limit the participation to uh, critical facilities, and we're actually leveraging a California definition of critical facilities, um, which are ones that can be more directly or tied to sort of community benefit. Um, so, you, you know, there, it's a pretty expansive list of what's eligible, but it's not everybody that can participate in these programs. Um, next slide, please. So this is a ton of stuff and this will be in your packet. Um, basically, this is our Oregon results. And we, we've done, we did five technical studies over the couple of years of the program. And we basically leveraged um, uh, Oregon directive that resiliency planning should be focused on, um, on the facility should plan on being offline for two weeks. So, um, if possible, you know, what would it take to, to allow that facility to continue operations with, um, for two weeks, assuming the grid is out for that long. So basically we use that as our gold standard and trying to figure out what it would take to allow those facilities to, to stay online for two weeks. Um, Standard resiliency, um, that was just sort of our baseline, either leveraging existing equipment on site, but not prejudging sort of uh, fossil fuel type generators. So you can see with a lot of these facilities, maybe they already had existing solar or existing generators on site, but it's just adding facilities to provide that backup power if the grid goes out. You know, what would it cost to get to be uh, able to sustain that two week outage. Um, enhanced resiliency, which is the next category down, is adding primarily adding storage to the existing site, which allows the diesel generator to operate more efficient or uh, to operate more efficiently. Basically, you get one run through with the storage. And then the generator actually runs to power the storage and the storage actually follow low, follows the load. So the generator burns less fuel because it's not actually following the load. The storage is following the load. Um, so uh, you can get further with even the existing generator on site. And then the comprehensive resiliency um, down at the bottom uh, is what happens or what would it take to add solar to even increase that ability 
and limit the amount of uh, uh, um, fossil fuels to the existing storage on site. So you would never during that two weeks of an outage have to rely on the delivery of fossil fuels to the site mm -hmm. to keep the generator running. So um, you can see there's a bunch of capital costs. You know, the big issue there, the big issue, I guess, I'll, it's circled, is when you talk with, you know, facility managers, they, the first thing they want to talk about is, you know, the capital costs. For example, the water treatment plant that we recently studied, um, the capital costs for just installing a diesel generator is $110,000. Um, if there's a two week outage, they'll need, they'll burn, you know, and this is older numbers because it's probably $20,000 worth of fuel at this point, but it's, it was a $10,000 a year ago. Um, you know, to do a project where you rely on solar and storage primarily, the capital cost goes up to $2.8 million. The savings for fuel is is lower. It's down to about, you know, it's $5,000 worth of fuel to get through a two week outage. So there are some savings, um, but when you're a practical sort of what we found is sort of practical facility managers see those two and, um, and are unwilling to, uh, or want to understand more the long-term benefits of it um, to move forward with that type of project. Um, we did, you can see we worked with a, di a number of different project facilities. We looked at community centers, which much smaller loads, um, and, the pro and the capital projects are, costs are much more um, manageable from a facility manager perspective. Um, you know, fire districts, you know, relatively low load, even when they're operating, you know, those projects, um, and they typically already have fossil generators um, uh, installed. So the capital costs are significantly lower for those types of projects. So just, we had collected this data, just thought for this group, it might be helpful to just sort of understand those sort of nuts and bolts of what it means to do an individual facility microgrid that relies on solar and, st and storage, rat typically in conjunction, I guess, with fossil fuel generators, but in some cases um, without a fossil generator. Um, next slide, please. More information. I uh, just thought it was there, so we provide it. The interesting thing is that in California, um, the metrics are a little different. Um, our sort of base case is being able to survive 24 hours without uh, power. The mid case is 72 hours without power, and the uh, long term is one week without power. And it's um, you know, pretty much the same sort of metrics, lower costs up front um, for just getting through 24 hours, um, larger costs, the longer you want to stay off grid or your assumption for um, how long to stay off grid. The, you know, the primary driver of the additional cost is the kilowatt hours or megawatt hours of storage necessary to make it through that outage. Um, so, super practical information thought might be useful to to move the to understand um, what resiliency might mean. I'll do I'll I'll go through the Redwood Coast because that is a multi customer, and then I'll cut the other stuff out. Um, so next slide. Okay, Redwood Coast. It was talked about. That is a multi customer uh, microgrid at the end of a circuit. Um, which is really nice. It serves 18 or so customers. Uh, one of them is a small airport and a Coast Guard um, helicopter station. Um, it's got a number of different aspects to it, uh, a bunch of private generation or small scale generation, a relatively significant battery. Um, next slide, please. So the cost of that project, uh, 
estimated cost was $11 million, a little over $11 million um, to, to be able to isolate that section. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely creating some uh, megawatt hours of power. Um, you know, on the benefit side, it does create about $356,000 worth of sort of energy benefits to the, uh, to the owners of those facilities, of those generating facilities. There were 37 FTE with about $1.5 million in earnings um, in during constructing this project. So there is definitely that local job impact, but it does take a bit at $356,000 a year to cover that $11 million cost. So that um, these projects are hard to pencil from a straight economic perspective, but they do uh, work and they probably need support to get off the ground. Uh, Last slides, and I won't even get dig into the stuff. Um, basically, we're trying to get better at understanding what small scale stuff costs in the integrated resource plan and the clean energy plan that we are going to be working on in Oregon. We don't have, there's not a lot of good information. Um, I was hoping to get small scale information for this presentation, but it's being developed as we speak, mostly focused on small scale. Um, solar energy opportunities. Um, next slide. So our resource planners basically said, you know, if you're trying to understand the cost differential, um, Lazard is pretty good. It shows utility scale stuff below the line and um, customer scale stuff above the line and just some of the different cost differential between those types of projects. So in the hopes of uh, speeding things up, I'll call it quits there and answer any questions. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate you. And we'll, I'll wait, I'll, we'll also have you for the rest of our time together. So if there's questions that come up later or points you want to make, we can, make, we can integrate them there. Um, Grant had a question. Are there additional requirements other than income for the businesses you listed, such as grocery convenience stores, to participate in the program? Uh, uh, well, the grocery stores have to be small, so it can't be Walmarts. And um, it, so they're sort of. I don't know, family owned. I think it's the actual definition is less than $15 million worth of income uh, or worth of sales or something like that. So there are some restrictions, uh, but, you know, small sort of local grocery stores, small sort of corner markets and the like are definitely included. And realistically that that expansion comes from the fact that in in sort of frontier communities, and uh, and rural communities, oftentimes those are the community centers by default. So expanding that definition to sort of support those local assets um, was insightful from uh, the California Public Utility Commission, and we uh, so we adopted that. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Eric. And then we'll go ahead and move on to Keisha, and then we'll do our 10 minute break after her presentation and then get back for the breakout rooms. Yes, so we have Keisha coming up next, if I can turn a slide. Um, all right, there, off to you. Stephanie, just uh, hold off on this slide for just a second. Oh. I'll do a little intro here before I yes. dazzle everyone with that <laughs> data rich slide. Um, hi, I'm Keisha Brockman with the Oregon Public Utility Commission. Thanks to Odo for this workshop series. This has uh, really been so great to hear everyone's presentations. Um, so the just I'm going to be talking kind of about um, how these generators are compensated, um, and uh, that, that's the primary focus. Um, so first, I'll just mention that the Public Utility Commission provides economic regulation of the investor-owned utilities, and that's because they operate largely in a monopoly environment. And um, we work to ensure that the utilities provide safe, reliable, high quality service at just and reasonable rates. Um, and as Eric just showed on his last slide, um, the um, difference between the utility scale and small scale projects, I mean, generally, um, the utility acquires uh, generation to meet customers' needs through a competitive bidding process, which can include both third party and utility owned projects. And um, that results in the kind of prices I think that Eric showed in that slide. Um, the small 
renewable energy generators have a difficult time competing in that process. And we know through all of these presentations that have been made throughout this workshop series that um, those projects do bring additional benefits. And so there may be public policy reasons to support those projects. And in those cases, the PUC has um, the opportunity to set the price for um, those, those projects. Um, and generally, when the PUC does that, it's focused on complying with the public policy, um, maintaining um, customer indifference um, between resources to the extent possible. Um, and uh, the long-term goal would be that the, um, the compensation for the generation reflects the value that that generation brings to the utility system, which is what the uh, ratepayers are paying for. Okay, so um, now, Stephanie, go ahead and flip the slide, please. And you can see that what I've done here is just listed a number of different um, mechanisms for compensating small-scale um, projects. So the first is one that we've talked about quite a bit in a previous workshop, and that is um, through avoided cost. The driver for this was um, the Federal Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act of 1978. Um, this resulted in standard contracts, which Ormond mentioned as being a benefit to small developers so that they don't have to um, negotiate unique contract terms with um, uh, a utility. And the rates that these generators are compensated for um, are based on the resource that the utility would otherwise have had to build to um, acquire um, comparable energy. And so we call it the avoided cost. What cost is the, is the utility avoiding by, by um, acquiring energy from this small scale generator versus um, what otherwise would have been required? And it does not take into consideration additional benefits that the uh, project might bring to the system. Um, the second is, um, I'll talk a little bit about the resource value of solar which is not currently being um, applied as a um, means of compensation, but it was an investigation that resulted also through um, public, oh, let's see, I'm sorry, I should have, I should have, um, did I need to clarify the approach? Well, I'll skip it for time's sake on, on the avoided cost. I'm sorry, I skipped through that on the slide. Um, if you have questions, we can come back to that. Um, the, resource value of solar effort was undertaken to um, look more broadly than PERPA at, uh, as I said, trying to look at what, how to compensate um, resources, not just based on what investments are avoided, but rather what values that resource brings to the system. Um, and so it could, um, in looking at this, the, the commission wanted to consider elements that would directly impact the cost of service to the utility customers, as I described, but could also consider, um, of course, the financial cost to comply with um, carbon regulation. Uh, on the other hand, it would not consider um, the benefits of job impacts, for example. Um, so really focusing on um, the value to the utility system. Um, let's see. So the um, the process included um, added sort of eleven or included um, eleven different elements. So energy capacity as well as others that um, would be considered uh, utility system costs. And I'm sorry. Uh, oh, no, yeah, no specific. Um, I thought that was an incomplete sentence, I'm sorry. Um, so the Arvos was explored, but uh, has not been um, implemented into, into a um, actual compensation mechanism. So there is also um, net metering, um, which originated uh, a ways back. And um, that is a simple crediting approach designed for behind the meter usage, um, where the generation directly offsets the customer's consumption. Um, and that means that the customers being generated, uh, sorry, being 
that the customer generator, in this case, is being credited for that generation at the retail rate. Um, and that can roll over month to month for up to a year. And that retail rate um, is higher than the value that that um, generation brings to the system. So that retail rate considers uh, lots of additional operating costs for the utility. And so net metering is considered um, an incentive program. Um, I'm going to skip over green tariff and come to that last. I should have listed that last. The um, community solar program is another incentive program. This was um, driven specifically by legislation, Senate Bill 1547. And the rates for that were the goal was to utilize this um, resource value of solar approach, um, but that was insufficient to stand up the program, um, that the cost of um, building and uh, operating the projects uh, outweighed the value to the system. And, um, and so in order to stand up that program, the rate was set um, very comparably to how it is with net metering. It's roughly equal to the retail, um, residential retail rates. And now um, there are different rates for residential, commercial, and low income residential um, customers that are participating in that. Um, let's see. So that brings me to the green tariff which is a um, potential way for customers to place a value on the other benefits of the energy that's being generated. Um, and it could be local economic development. It could be um, uh, sustainability targets that have to do with um, locally cited generation or locally manufactured components um, in any of these benefits could be valued by the customer in the price that they pay for that um, for that generation the customer would be able to contract directly with the generator uh, and um, receive that power so that so the green tariff options that are facilitated by the utilities um, right now, we have the voluntary renewable energy tariffs um, for large customers under House Bill 2021. There's also the, the possibility, as was mentioned by an earlier presenter, of expanding this to include um, to, uh, municipalities and community-wide um, green power options. Um, so that would allow the potentially would allow a small scale renewable energy project to set the price um, that is necessary to make it whole. And if the community is willing to pay that price, that would be a way to um, bring that additional compensation to that project. So in terms of rate impact of small scale renewable energy generation, so acquisition of new energy can, can cause um, it, an increase in rates. Um, but when we look at the rate impact, we're kind of depends on how that compensation is being paid by the utility, how that generation is being compensated by the utility customers and how that compares to an alternative way to achieve those same benefits to the utility system. Um, so utility customers will typically pay rates that cover the cost of acquiring and delivering that energy in a reliable manner and in compliance with uh, state policy. Um, there um, are ways to realize the additional societal benefits of community-based projects, and some examples of those include, include the Department of Energy small-scale renewable energy grants, so state, state funding to help bring down the capital costs or um, Low income loan, I'm sorry, low rate, low interest rate loan programs. Um, the community solar program offers these um, higher 
rates, higher than avoided cost rates, and does have capacity in the program for uh, that's carved out for small scale projects. Uh, so that presents an opportunity. And then the green tariff option um, that I mentioned. Uh, I'll also note, I think it was Eric in his presentation noted that um, under House Bill 2021, the utilities will be creating clean energy plans that describe how they will comply with the greenhouse gas reduction requirements um, that the state has set. And those include an element of um, assessing resilience. And so I'll just mention it's not on this slide, but the docket number for that is UM2225. And there have been a couple workshops recently where um, staff and some consultants, particularly national labs, um, are working to, um, to assess the non-energy impacts of, um, of the clean energy plans and also a risk-based examination of resilience opportunities um, in the plan. So UM2225 would be a docket to engage in if you're um, interested in tracking that. So I think that is all that I will uh, mention. I didn't include a um, slide with my contact information, but I am on the email um, distribution list and I would welcome um, follow-up inquiries from anybody via email. Great, thanks, Keisha. Um, I think we mostly have comments. Um, okay. Versus questions in the chat. Um, there was just a note from Angela that I'll read. Um, additional context for RVOs. She says, Oregon's value is lower than any other state because it does not reflect the full value solar brings. This is in part why it's not currently being used as it actually undervalues solar. Then James adds, it's also his understanding that technically the only current statutory use of RVOs will be at the end of the volumetric incentive rate program for the ongoing generation of those systems. Um, and then um, Eric Anderson from PAC um, just mentions that the 2.2 megawatt solar facility is actually owned by investors and is participating in the market in California. And there is also a 300 kilowatt net metering project at the airport. So he was just adding some details there. Um, any questions for Keisha? Other than those comments? people are excited to take their break. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much, Keisha. Um, so we'll go ahead and take that 10 minutes. Um, why don't we just, if that works for you, Stephanie, reconvene at 11.35. Sounds good. Okay, we'll see you all then. All right, it's 11.35. I still have a few bites of my lunch left, so hopefully you had the time you needed. 
Stephanie, I think I'll turn it straight over to you. Sounds good. All right. Now we could do like a little like, hey, give a thumbs up or whatever if you're back kind of thing, just to like see that we have a good number of people. Because if we're going straight to breakouts, I want to make sure we have everybody. So yeah, do you some sort of like indicator that you're around as long as we see a good number of faces or thumbs up. We'll go ahead and get started. Oh, Maggie has a Maggie's raising her hand to tell us she's here. Okay, sorry. It was like, oh, Maggie has a question. Sorry, I'm just excited. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. All right. So now we're going to move into our breakout groups, like we've done in the prior workshops. Um, we're going to do two of them today. So the first one is going to focus on benefits. So in, within your breakout group, um, we want to focus on benefits that are unique to small scale renewable energy projects, and we're going to break these into categories. Um, the direct economic impacts, indirect, those kind of trickle down economic impacts that, um, you know, we talk a lot about, like the multiplier effect type of stuff, um, health impacts, climate impacts, resilient impacts, any other impacts. Um, to the community at large, um, however you guys want to view it, we're going to come back and we're going to put it into a table that we can then utilize in the final report and the next workshop. We're going to do the same thing for costs after this. So, Linda, whenever you're ready to break us out into our groups. It's going to be about 20 minutes, just so you know.
Sorry, Ramfis, I didn't see a we're almost done thing. I should have worn it. All right, am I getting this right that Rob's going to moderate us and Stephanie's? Yes, so I'm trying to get my screen back up here. Um, so here we go. So essentially, we're hoping to have each group um, share what they came up with, and I'm going to try in live time. We'll see how it goes um, <laughs> to insert them into this uh, little graphic here. So each group will present on the benefit that they identified, which category it falls into, um, if it's unique to small scale or not, um, who the beneficiary of this would be, and then any other comments that you might have. So does group one want to go? If anybody remembers if they were in group one. Hey, Stephanie, I was in group one. I'd love it if somebody else in the group wanted to um, kind of give an overview, but I'm happy to do so if, uh, if needed. Yeah, and also maybe, I think it might be self-evident, but um, I just got a chat from someone that was in one of the groups that just got in. They were like late coming back somehow. So you might just want to see what we're doing again. Okay, yeah, just each group is going to be presenting um, and I'm going to be typing in the um, benefit that they came up with the category it falls into if it's economic um, health climate resiliency other if it's unique specific to small scale or not um, who the beneficiary of that benefit would be. Um, it can be the community at large, um, state of Oregon, the world, that kind of stuff, or in any other comments you have about that benefit that you'd like to mention. All right, Jessica, did anybody volunteer from your group or is it you? I think it might be me. I saw Dan briefly appear, but then he um, turned off his camera, which I think is the international sign for please not me. Um, so I'm happy to report back. Uh, so, in our group, we talked a lot about um, that it, it may appear um, to be determined if we can get enough data that resilience has um, some of the biggest impacts and uh, several of these are uh, really focused on the, the help that local communities are going to need in outages and um, it was, it was pointed out that even in some relatively small events, like ice storms and wildfires, we've had people without power for considerable lengths of time. Um, and so in a major disruption, like something like the Cascadia, um, earthquake, it, that kind of thing would become very critical. Um, and that we're, um, you know, there's some, as a part of that, there's some indirect economic impacts that go with that, which is. When you lose power, you can lose goods. For instance, um, Corvallis had a local grocery store that was affected by a substation disruption that um, took it took four or five days to get parts in so that they couldn't fix it. Um, so the you know indirect economic impacts are those things that could occur um, as a result of not having that power available. Um, direct, if um, excuse me, direct economic impacts. Um, there's a lot of communities that are interested in the jobs or the um, effects that having local generation could have on them. For example, um, when you are when you're putting in your own local generation, that might be creating local jobs to help maintain and install that generation. Or uh, when you have um, Businesses, for instance, that are small businesses and tend to operate during the day, having solar could offset quite a bit of their power needs, um, especially if that's when they're the most active. Uh, that variability of solar not being available at night might not be as big a, a deal. Um, and then um, I'm kind of looking through the notes here. Um, in economic, direct economic opportunities, as, you know, as renewables become more of a the standard across the country and around the world, um, those places that have invested in renewables um, businesses, renewable development businesses will be leaders and therefore have the jobs associated with it. Um, and it was mentioned, you know, Oregon was a 
a loss for the timber industry. There was a lot of jobs lost with that, and this could be an opportunity to help regain some of that um, uh, footing that we lost there. Um, and then, um, as you know, the costs go down for solar. Uh, this is sort of an indirect cost. This, as the costs go down for solar, this may be an opportunity to help offset other um, fossil fuel generation needs. And um, I'll ask Grant to um, correct me if I'm wrong because we didn't directly discuss this, but I think he was referring to things such as um, maybe you have backup power that's through um, fossil fuel generator and maybe solar and storage would be an opportunity to help um, offset that. Um, or potentially fuel your vehicle um, if you have an electric vehicle or something like that. And I think as far as direct benefits, that is the list. Um, and so I'll ask Dan, Grant, um, and Tira, is there anything I've missed that you want to flag for the group? I think you got it. Great. Thanks. I think you got it as well. Thank you. All right, group two. It's me, Stephanie, or my group, and we didn't get to the point of asking somebody else to present. So pardon more me. Um, so we went through and categorized, and um, I'll try to not name ones that aren't uh, that are already said. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't think this is there. Energy dollars can go to local communities and they can pay off the debt, pay for the system, or even over time provide revenue to fill service gaps. The Aberdeen project came up specifically that you don't need to write that down necessarily. Um, and then could support union jobs. And I have in my notes here a lot of questions for Stephanie to grapple with um, related to this one. And she works on what comes after this meeting. Under indirect economic impacts, um, I slid energy sovereignty there, although it's one that could go in all different places. But in a community owned type of scenario, people can choose for, them, for themselves how they get power. And the various different pieces that can go with that. Um, I'm not really sure we put this one either, but essentially um, achieving economies of scale. So as we have more of different types of small energy projects, they can get cheaper. And then reduce land use conflicts. Um, but that comes with also less efficient use of the space, acre to acre, watt to watt, so on. Um, for climate impacts or no health impacts, um, talked about specifically, um, commercial food waste being converted to biogas and how that can reduce greenhouse gases by reducing the transportation of food waste. You said biogas? Mm-hmm. And then also, um, this is also related to resilience, but the like literal um, ability to have power can have health impacts during an emergency. So if people have access to water and food or whatever, because there's a facility that's open that has power that can provide them with options that can have public health benefits, however you want to say that. And then medical care can be provided if there's power. Uh, that wouldn't otherwise be able to be provided without it. And then finally, um, under health impacts, reduced reliance on diesel generators. And then um, I think that you already got one. Now I'm just seeing mostly mine, but or our groups, but um, there's also, for example, bio waste energy projects that can have water quality impacts. Um, that's under health, though. I just put that in the wrong place. I apologize. And then, um, oh, I think I just like read you the health ones and said they were climate ones, basically. Oops. 
Um, under climate, just broadly increasing renewables reduces greenhouse gases, although that is not necessarily unique. And then resilience impacts, um, um, we already talked about one of them. Um, I'm not sure this one exactly came up, but um, that we kind of know in Oregon specifically our liquid fuels could get really tied up. We have a really, I think most of you probably know that we have a um, critical energy infrastructure hub in Portland that has the vast majority of liquid fuels in the state that's in a liquefaction zone. So if there's a Cascadia quake, we know that it's basically going to not <laughs> not be not be servicing our needs for quite some time. So um, so kind of providing um, a backup to that dynamic specifically came up. And then I'll ask my group if there's anything that I had left off. That sounds good. All right, I believe we were group three. Um, so I'm gonna be talking and typing. We're gonna see how this goes. Um, so a lot of the stuff you guys have talked about in other groups. Um, so like phasing out the diesel generators for sure was already mentioned. Um, so I'll focus more on the jobs, the education um, infrastructure increases. Sorry, I keep on looking down at my notes. Um, the training and human capital, if we become more skilled, we could potentially export those skills to other states as they're developing their programs after us. And I'll type ours after, sorry, I'm not good at this. Um, the diversification of um, local communities in terms of like economic diversification. Um, Spinoff benefits from some of these projects. Um, I can see a lot of these with um, the commercial food waste, but this one was more looking at the heat generated from some of these projects, potentially going to heat greenhouses during winter, um, dry kiln for lumber, um, and rural hospitals being able to be set up as emergency first responders um, during a crisis if they have these uh, resiliency benefits built in. So I'll type those after because I have them written. So if group four wants to go. All right. I tried to recruit an actual work group member, but we were too busy coming up with lots of good content. So I took the notes and I'll, I'll share it. Um, we have quite a bit of overlap, but somewhere I think there's a, a little twist on what's already been said. On the resilience piece, uh, Maggie, who was in our group, mentioned that um, in the case of a lot of tribal projects, what we see with a lot of the underserved communities and tribal communities is that they are often the last ones to be brought back online in a power outage. And so the resilience value is really magnified for some communities more than others. Um, when we look at the, um, both when the power, you know, when is the power gonna be brought back on? And we didn't talk specifically about this, but the, the impact on the residents of not having power, you know, a, a refrigerator full of food has a lot more meaning to some people than it does to others um, as, in terms of the, the value of that. Um, we had a, a lot of really interesting um, benefits associated with the ability of local projects to develop specific sites and specific resources that are passed over by large developers. And so it's these sort of niche sites or sites with other barriers that may not um, warrant development by some of the larger um, developers. And um, the, the Patu Wind Project was one example where the site was adjacent to an airspace that had some um, red strings attached to it. And it took a local, you know, it took Armand, a uh, local guy to, to get over those barriers. But there were others. Um, one was um, smaller projects, locally developed projects are more likely to capture some of these odd waste streams um, like landfill gas or, or bio um, streams like, um, like Jessica mentioned. Um, also in kind of the category of siting, these locally developed small projects have reduced nimbyism. And so there's a greater acceptance of siting um, and let's see, I think that kind of captures the siting piece. Um, 
On the economics piece, I think one that we brought up that we hadn't heard yet is the local tax base being boosted. Um, and also, just from a cost standpoint, there is some evidence that in, in some cases, smaller projects can actually have lower soft costs um, if they don't have a huge organization with a lot of internal bureaucracy, they can actually have pretty low costs on some of these smaller projects when you get a good good team together to put them, you know, to, to build and operate the projects. Um, we also had Eric um, with, with PAC in our um, team and among a lot of these other things, he mentioned that in some cases these local smaller projects can have positive benefits to the um, distribution system by reducing line losses and deferring investments in grid infrastructure. And I would, um, Maggie also mentioned that these smaller projects are sometimes easier. Um, they kind of mit mitigate the risks and costs associated with transmission studies and interconnection. <clears throat> I've got all these written down, so if you don't grab them. I, I can share them after the fact, and I'd welcome any of our committee members to fill in any holes that I've left. Did you mention the health benefits, Rob? I didn't think I heard that, but maybe I did. I did not. Health and carbon were both brought up as um, additional benefits. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, in terms of not having toxic pollution from most renewables, both in our community and folks who have coal generation and oil refineries in their communities. I don't know if you really caught it, uh, but uh, small projects can also take advantage of existing transmission. Yeah, and as Armin mentioned, if you have an interconnection agreement for 10 megawatts and your capacity factor is 36%, there's a lot of headroom potentially um, in that 10 megawatts to export a lot more of the time if you add batteries or solar or kind of diversify the resources within, an, within a given interconnection to increase the, the capacity factor for the site. All right, group five. Hey, this is Ruchi. Um, I didn't ask anyone to volunteer, so I guess I'll do it. Um, my group was group five, and we had Hannah from Bonneville, Mark from Lane County, Ryan from Central Electric Co-op, and Tom from Ashland. So I'll just go over a few things, but you four, please <laughs> jump in if I missed anything or we got kind of cut off at the end because our uh, we didn't notice the... Um, the 60 minute or 60 second timer. So I may have missed a part of the end there. Um, there's sort of like an overarching piece where in the Northwest, the hydropower system has such great economic benefit that payback is a lot longer for smaller projects without grants or subsidies. So it's kind of an overarching comment there that was a thread throughout. Um, but there is a local benefit from the installers that may work on smaller scale projects in terms of jobs in the local community. And one of the specific pieces there was those types of jobs, jobs um, are likely to be very local in nature and stay in the community. Um, there was also um, a discussion about how um, in Ashland, there's been a lot of work to incentivize solar um, on rooftops, and that's actually kept Ashland from reaching the tier two Bonneville rate. Um, I think the the quote there was that it's a uh, 20 average megawatts, but there's 4.5 megawatts of rooftop solar. Um, and so even though currently tier two power is cheaper than tier one, a few years ago, that wasn't the case and the dynamics might be going back to that. Um, and then there was also indirect uh, economic benefit as it relates to jobs, kind of like a multiplier. Um, in terms of health impacts, uh, there was recognition of um, high heat events and having the ability to have cooling centers or warming centers, depending on um, uh, what the event is like. 
Um, there was also some discussion that a big focus of health impacts is really on transportation related emissions since um, the region is so hydro dominated and um, already has sort of um, less localized pollution from, from that. Uh, but in terms of climate and greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, uh, Mark mentioned uh, the gorilla in the room in, in Lane County is their um, landfill, and they did do an RFP for some anaerobic digestion consideration, but there's a lot of steps before being able to build that, and the generation wouldn't necessarily compensate for the cost of building that out, so it didn't really pencil out. Um, there's also interest on... Um, you know, using uh, methane emissions from landfill instead for um, replacement for, um, you know, natural gas as an alternative and Northwest Natural might have a, um, a different uh, or higher kind of incentive to, to do that rather than the electric utilities. Um, a lot of discussion, I would say, primarily on resilience impacts, um, you know, talking about developing microgrids. Um, especially in conjunction to public works buildings in, in local jurisdictions where there might be oper emergency operations. Um, but it was kind of a note that even if there was, um, you know, some sort of uh, value stream for carbon emission reduction, um, diesel generators are still so much cheaper. Uh, and so a struggle to sort of get traction um, to pencil out on a microgrid even if there is um, a uh, interest in a microgrid, the likelihood is you would probably still keep the diesel generator as like an additional backup from that. Um, Tom also uh, agreed with the sort of emergency operations center and data center um, in uh, Ashland as being a ripe for an interest in, in, um, in a microgrid. Uh, there is also discussion about wildfire and public safety power shutoffs, shutoffs and um, customers being more in tune to find other options for backup generation and battery storage. Um, also net metered customers or um, uh, looking for battery components at, as well to add that, um, that um, storage component. So while, um, you know, wildfire is a, huge burden for the state to navigate. It, it is kind of making clear that those conversations about dispatchable generation and battery uh, storage is, is going to be helpful for resilience benefits. Um, let's see, we talked about pooling shelters for communities um, could be at the emergency operation center that kind of came up in the resilience benefit. Um, and then there was an interesting discussion about time of day pricing, as well as other rate structures that could help encourage behavior. Like if you had a smaller scale um, renewable energy project that had battery storage, and if there was the ability to switch to um, a different power source, if there was high demand on the grid because of um, 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 AC use, for example. Uh, so we talked about residential demand, um, work, peak rebates, time of use, and general for uh, making better use of solar and storage that's more dispatchable, lots of opportunities there. Um, okay, I, that was a sum up. Anything to add, Hannah, Mark, Ryan, or Tom? All right. Um, let's, we're... I, I will clean this up before it goes out and gather more notes, um, just so you know. I know this is a mess right now. Um, but for the next one, we are going to do one more breakout. And um, this one might have to be just 15 minutes, Linda, just because of time considerations to make sure we have time to wrap up at the end. Um, but for this one, we're going to focus on the other side of things, the costs. So the unique costs associated with small scale renewable energy projects. And we're going to come up with a similar list like we just did. Okay, so uh, Linda, if you want to take the show and get us into our breakout groups.
right. Are we just about all back? Linda, do you know if there's still people coming back in? They all should be back. Okay, perfect. All right, so I scrapped my fancy table and I'm just going bullets this time. All right, so <laughs> if group one wouldn't mind getting going with some of the costs that they identified. Sure, happy to do Stephanie. Um, so the costs that we identified, I think were largely around um, and again, I want to invite Dan and Diane to jump in um, at any point uh, to, to add or correct. Uh, but they were largely identified around there's there's expenses involved in in these smaller organizations, communities uh, having to engage in the process of of citing of looking for interconnection, all of these things that are more expensive to do. Um, because of the time involved uh, for someone who's not a part of an organization that regularly works on these things. So that could be a utility or maybe a large independent power producer. Um, and so, you know, specifically, we identified some things such as there is, of course, a scale of of development, you're always going to have um, a con well, not always, but often have economies of scale when you build larger facilities versus these smaller um, smaller facilities. It's also, there's a higher cost involved in the siting process simply because of the time investment that's needed for um, someone who's not familiar with or doesn't work through this process as part of their regular job. Um, there's a lack of coordination between utilities, independent power producers, communities, and other entities that are interested in small scale community renewables. And that also leads to sort of this lack of of the developers, small scale developers being able to um, easily move forward in development. There's just a lot of different pieces playing. And um, whereas a utility or, or large independent power producer may be able to synergize some of their relationships to make these things run more smoothly. Again, investments of time um, was the, the lack here. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm looking one more thing just general knowledge and skill sets for people working on these smaller programs. They may not have the siting requirements knowledge or the interconnection data or knowledge to be able to easily um, work through some of those, those factors. Um, and you, larger utilities do this type of planning for um, investments through their IRP work, um, whereas these, these projects are going to be done outside of that and kind of have to fit into planning work that's been done um, by others, uh, rather than sort of being done at the beginning of a planning um, opportunity, whether that's IRP or something else. So, um, I think I captured it, but please, Dan, Diane, if there's anything I missed, jump in. I, I like it. Thank you. Appreciate the report. Yeah, I think I, you got. I, I would just add one small piece, which is it sounds like the California PUC is. Um, is starting to tackle some of that coordination between different groups that um, you know may not be happening. Maybe we should look to it as a model. Great. All right, group two. That's us, right, Christy? We were group two. Sure, are, Nikita. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I can kick it off and um, if I forget anything or leave anything out, um, I think my team members can uh, fill in the gaps. So we talked about, um, uh, I think this was brought up in, in the first one as well, um, the cost imposed by the learning curve. So there might be a lack of experience. Um, uh, I think as the previous group mentioned, particularly true for uh, the interconnection space and contracting. Um, we talked about something that might not necessarily be a cost, but a challenge that just needs to be navigated and planned for. Um, so it's the, uh, like a relationship, um, uh, between workforce development from large between larger scale and smaller scale. Um, so you would tend to get generally get larger workforce training hours and larger scale construction, but, it, but, um, uh, we talked about the 
the fact that there are ways to address this for smaller scale renewables. And so this may just require better planning. Um, uh, we talked a bit about um, what the current union um, practices and opportunities are for, for specifically PGE um, and some question marks that still exist and um, maybe some challenges around um, union density for utility projects or um, uh, or sorry, for, for public projects and wages tending to be lower for community scale projects. Um, but that might be something that's changing. Um, uh, and we talked about transaction costs that are associated with maybe bringing uh, benefits to communities, so through contractual arrangements. So this might be more um, work and engagement during the development phase. Um, so also, I would say a benefit and also a cost. Um, uh, and then we spent some time talking about um, investment risk. Um, and so talking about like um, the fact that capital development in this in this uh, space isn't risk free um, that uh, it could be exposing uh, folks to financial loss. Um, we had some um, clarifications about this. So to the extent that community members are investing in projects is um, uh, could be a cost risk to them, particularly around um, production and performance. Um, of projects, so making sure that projects are doing what they're anticipated, expected, required to do. Um, and if the projects aren't funded by community, they're funded by investors. Um, uh, so there might also be a risk um, for investors of a project versus risk to a community. And this depends on what the um, how the how the project is um, attributed. Um, and I feel like I probably missed a lot in that risk conversation, um, but uh, let's see, I think I had some other notes. Um, yeah, so depending on who is exposed to the risks can have disproportionate impacts um, on smaller communities who um, in their ability to maybe where, wear, you know, whether an event um, and again, that's production and performance risk specifically. Um, yeah, I will. I probably, like I said, probably missed a lot there. So um, if I missed anything, I'll open it up to um, to my group members. Or if I miss um, uh, communicated something. That'd be great to me. All right. Um, it was just uh, Steve Uffelman and myself for group three. Um, and he graciously allowed me to be the speaker. Um, that was a joke. Uh, in, we talked about the cost of environmental impact. I'm not going to type these because I'm not that good at multitasking, as we've discovered. Um, environmental impact studies can be a, a higher proportion of overall costs for these small scale projects. Um, we talked about how, especially with non solar small scale projects, they have a very hard time getting economies of scale great enough to actually go through with the project. Um, we talked about interconnection costs. Islanding costs, um, wheeling charges came up and how those can really, you know, tilt the scales towards a project not being viable. Um, uh, zoning costs, um, we just, these are just the broad topics that we went through. Um, infrastructure and grid costs. And one thing that specifically came up was the right of way costs. If you're having to install um, some transmission lines through an area where you then have to get the right of way on top of the actual um, just building the pro project. Um, uh, getting, uh, paying for the expertise in engineering to develop a lot of these projects can be a very, very big cost. Um, and then also just uh, finding skilled labor um, can be a huge cost, not necessarily unique to um, small scale, but you are competing with some of the larger scale projects. Um, did I miss anything, Steve? No, no, that sounded good. Thank you. All right, group four. And I'll add mine to the list after the talk. All right, and I do have notes, um, Stephanie, so that we can um, true up after the meeting. Um, but we had a lot of the a similar discussion to what we've heard in other groups. Um, we had some specific things. Um, one was the the nature of um, of of reimbursement schedules through PURPA projects is that you're trying to make a 20 year schedule in a unpredictable future around pricing. 
and that there's kind of value and risk associated with that process. I mean, developers want the 20 year contract for bankability, but there's also just kind of this unknown um, cost structure associated with the 20 year energy price prediction. So um, that's, that was part of it. Um, Angela brought up something that perhaps turns into a recommendation or a, it, it's essentially a policy oriented, um, the restriction of community solar and purple projects in the case of solar to three megawatts. Um, that that is a essentially an artificial um, market you know construct which is affecting the ability of projects to take advantage of the economies of scale that could happen from three megawatts up to twenty megawatts, which is where we see a lot of the other thresholds occurring in targets for small scale in this study. So perhaps twenty megawatts um, could be a threshold for all programs in the state. Um, <clears throat> Maggie brought up that um, tribes and some other communities may not have credit ratings. And so access to credit and developers, um, project development is limited in certain communities. Um, that goes for um, both planning and construction, and this gets to the capacity issue that we've heard in the past. Um, also kind of related to capacity, um, large Large developers often have in house staff that small projects would have to hire out as consulting staff. And so it may come at a higher price for um, services like engineering and um, you know, development of, of project drawings and all that sort of thing. Um, can be higher if you have to if you have to contract that out. Um, Mike brought up that. A lot of these projects are cited within COU territories or will be cited within U COU territories and that these COUs often have a 100% um, contract requirement with BPA and so they don't really have a use for the power and the result is that you um, they don't have an incentive to develop them and then if it's being developed for another utility that's not in their territory, we have the wheeling costs, um, which hit the projects with a you know financial penalty. Um, an interesting one also for Mike was that, you know, rural areas, and I guess this isn't necessarily unique to small scale, but it's certainly unique to the remote rural projects is that limitations on housing and workforce drive up the costs associated with getting projects built in rural areas um, because you have to um, account for travel um, and essentially you know getting getting your workforce to the site um, um, angela also brought up that current regulations and rates don't recognize the value of storage or really any of the ancillary benefits that can come from these projects and so um, you know, we talked about if we really want to bring along both the value of batteries for their um, ancillary benefits as well as the resilience value, um, there should be, you know, a mechanism to recognize those values within the rates and that some of those rates are truly um, benefiting utility ratepayers and uh, there may be an opportunity there. Um, I don't know if I've missed anything really um, obvious that hasn't been brought up. I'd definitely welcome the the crew to jump on because I bounced around in my notes a lot. I'll see if anyone does. In the meantime, um, while we're turning over to Ruchi um, for the last group or whoever's presenting for that last group, are there if anybody is planning to give public comment, can you raise your hand so that we kind of know if we have any public comment? The last couple of workshops, we haven't had any, but if we do have any, I want to make sure we give you time. And since we were running 10 minutes late from the beginning of the day, um, we're, we're, we're not going past one o'clock. Don't worry. I'm just trying to like manage the time that we have left, the seven minutes as best I can. So we can go over to Ruchi and if there's no hands up, then great. Or if there are, that's great too. Go ahead. Um, great, I can get us started. Uh, our group was Mark, Ryan, and Tom this time from Lane County Central Electric Club and Ashland. Uh, we generally talked about um, 
how it's difficult to take advantage advantages of um, the economies of scale with a small scale project. And um, there's the risk of, um, you know, BPA costs if uh, you get too large. Uh, talked about interconnection costs. Um, Mark mentioned the pilot on the landfill as an example of that. Um, we talked about how the number of incentives that are out there um, exist because of the um, interest in bridging the gap between uh, small, you know, for small scale uh, projects to pencil out. Um, Tom had an example of, you know, Ashland, the incentives that they have on solar is why they have such high penetration of rooftop solar for residential and commercial. Um, we talked about how um, just in general, subs without subsidies, these projects don't um, pencil out and there needs to be a lot of mindfulness in making sure that non-participating members of a utility are not subsidizing participating members of a utility to ensure um, the rate structure, if it's being, um, if, if, if those costs for uh, smaller, smaller projects are being bridged with rate payer funds. Um, and then we had kind of a general discussion about California and how there's just not quantification of how much um, their sort of willingness to pay for, you know, a major disaster like Cascadia or some of the fires that have been um, experienced. If you need to have an EOC running for two months, two weeks or a couple months, um, you know, that's that might be a really high cost uh, for that kind of small project, but it might be worth it. Um, you know, if, if if your other kind of option is diesel generators that might have the diesel running out over that time period. And so how, how much is that? It's probably a lot, but the value is really high and who should pay for it um, was kind of an, an interesting aside that lends itself to the sort of, yes, it might be a high cost for smaller projects, but there might be also high value, so it's worth it. Um, and then uh, just a caution that there's really low rates in, in Oregon, at, you know, seven and a half cents here. And one of the comparisons for California was 35 cents a kilowatt hour. So um, th that's that's a piece. And then um, another interesting aside was the social cost of anxiety um, when there's uh, that results in real economic impact in the community for fire, Cascadia, heat events. Um, uh, okay, I think that's that's kind of a sum up. Anything I missed, Tom, Mark, or Ryan? Oh, sounds good. Great. Look at all those beautiful notes. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? So, yeah. Do you want to go? Do you have anything you want to go ahead with there? No, I was just going to thank everybody and see if there were any questions. So I know we're very limited on time. <laughs> Give a second for any last minute questions. I don't see any hands up or um, comments um, right now, but, um, but yeah, thanks everybody for attending. Um, so what's next for this group is on July 6th, our workshop number four crew will be getting together and be talking about planning for that workshop which is going to be kind of summarizing what we heard across the three first workshops. Um, and then also where there's data gaps or things that we haven't gotten to discuss yet that seem really important. Like I have on my mind, like, can we quantify some of the non-economic benefits of, um, of these sorts of projects? It's something we haven't really dug in on yet, just to give one example. So we'll kind of like work together to identify where those gaps are and then plan a workshop accordingly. But that workshop will all also be where we discuss and generate possible uh, solution ideas. So um, that will be coming up. So what, that planning meeting will happen July 6th and then the last meeting of this group, um, unless something comes up, will be July 28th and we'll be working to get Rafaela Sue Flanders. We also got another request for maybe Aberdeen, Washington for that project potentially, um, if they have somebody who could come present. So. Uh, we'll be working on putting all of that together with our staff and with the planning committee. So stay tuned and um, we'll see everybody back on July 28th. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay. Great. Thanks everybody. We really appreciate you being here and making the long time. So it's a whole morning plus lunch. <laughs> yes. Thank you everybody. Okay. Bye.